All right, it's me and my. <laughs> so, uh, so we have all the power to, right now, members. <laughs> so we are going to call this committee uh, to order. This is the uh, Monday, February 13th, 2023 meeting of the Minnesota Senate Transportation Committee. Um, it's about five minutes after three o'clock and we are in room 1100 of the Minnesota Senate building. We do not yet have a quorum. I will announce that whenever any of the members of my own party arrive. <laughs> I know at least one is in committee still. Um, and, uh, oh, great. So they're trickling in, it's busy times. Um, but we will, uh, members, we have uh, six items on the agenda today. Uh, we're gonna hear the Department of Public Safety's budget overview. Um, we don't yet have the actual bill language um, but I don't think it's too early to get the overview. And of course, uh, on the MMB website um, is available all of the narrative around all of the change items, as well as the overview of the agency itself. So I would encourage you to go check that out for further detail. Um, today is gonna be an overview from the Department of Public Safety. Uh, and then we have four of the agency policy bills that we'll hear, hopefully those are um, fairly straightforward and non-controversial, we'll find out. Um, and then we have Senator Port's Senate File 73, Adult Use Cannabis, which we will have a slightly more in-depth conversation, I suspect. So with that, I will invite our commissioner forward, welcome our new commissioner, and um, ask him to introduce himself as well as his trustee assistant. And we will uh, hear about the governor's recommendations for the Department of Public Safety budget transportation elements that we have jurisdiction over. Because of course we know that another portion of the Department of Public Safety is in the Judiciary Committee's jurisdiction. Welcome to the committee. Please uh, introduce yourself, Commissioner, and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, Chair Dibble, Vice Chair Morrison, Lee Jasinski, and members of the committee for the record. My name is Bob Jacobson and I am the Commissioner of the Department of Public Safety. Uh, thanks for having DPS here today to discuss our budget request uh, for our transportation divisions. I will present the agency-wide proposal today and then we will ask each division director to come up and present their items in more detail. And we'll all be available for questions uh, as needed. And I'm assisted by uh, Legislative Director uh, Jordan Haltofterheide. And I'll wait for the slides to come up if that works, Mr. Chair. All right. Uh, members, a, a quorum is present. Mr. Chair, I believe we are ready with right. our technology, and I'll, right. I'll proceed again, uh, as you know, Bob Jacobson. Um, the first item that we would like to bring to your attention is funding to maintain our current service levels. Uh, we are asking uh, for uh, increased funding because, as you know, we are dealing with uh, increases in costs associated with our current work, factors like inflation, IT costs. Uh, the Department of Public Safety has over 2,000 employees statewide and our employees are committed to delivering quality care and services to Minnesotans. This operating adjustment would allow our division to maintain that current level of service. For our DPS administration, uh, we have divisions like the State Patrol, DVS, and others that are really public facing. Uh, we have multiple divisions within DPS that are needed to support the work they do. Human resources, communications, fiscal, administrative services, even tribal and government relations are all critical to the work. And so without funding for those additional divisions, support divisions, DPS's other divisions could not function properly. We're also looking for, uh, the governor's looking for funding for community engagement. Uh, we know that that to us is deeply critical, necessary for all the work that we do. 
Uh, we do aim to grow our capacity to engage in authentic and meaningful community engagement, and we want to be able to best serve the public, which this should help us with. On the next slide, uh, we're looking at um, uh, putting on a um, uh, strategy and analytics team. Uh, that centralized strategy and analytics team would serve as a resource to agency leadership in areas of strategy, analytics, evaluation, and performance management and improvement. Uh, we know that the evidence-based approach has required this, this approach, and we uh, would endorse that investment. Uh, state rail safety oversight staff. Uh, currently, we have an office of one employee who's responsible for ensuring Minnesota's light rail infrastructure meets um, those safety standards so it can remain safe for the hundreds of thousands of riders and communities served by light rail trains. Uh, this request... Um, would uh, add one additional person. We're asking for an additional $20,000, which would then unlock about 80,000 in new federal funding. Uh, we're also looking to move soft body armor costs to the public safety budget. Um, the soft body armor historically was funded out of transportation. However, moving this to public safety uh, broadens it to meet the needs of our vast public safety professionals in Minnesota. And with that, um, I would ask uh, Colonel Langer, uh, who is the next person to, to talk about, uh, about these items. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Jacobson. Uh, Colonel Langer, if you could pause, if we could pause for one moment, because we have uh, someone new in the room. Uh, Tim Greenfield is going to be our new Lexi Stangle. So welcome, uh, Mr. Greenfield, if you could please introduce yourself and let everyone know who you are and who sent you. Sure. Uh, hello, everyone, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, my name is Tim Greenfield. Uh, I'm an attorney with Senate Council and Research. I, this is my first day, so I'm really uh, taking this all in. Uh, it's, it's been a bit of a day, but uh, I'm really looking forward to working with all of you uh, and uh, working with this committee to um, move things across. And um, I have over 10 years of experience here at the Senate, so um, while I may have only been attorney for a few of those, uh, I'm looking forward to jumping in as, as Senate Council. So thank you. And you worked with engrossing previously. I was with the engrossing office before right. then, yes. All right. So members, all the hard questions go to him today. <laughs> it's a hazing day. Um, and actually, I don't know if we ever actually introduced you, uh, Mr. Will. Did we do that? So Alex Will kind of showed up one day, a couple <laughs> weeks into session. Uh, uh, he was actually our uh, CLA from the beginning, but he had a previously planned trip overseas, and, uh, and so he uh, kind of snuck in one day about two weeks into session. So if you wanted to say hello and introduce yourself very briefly, sorry about that, to put you on the spot. Yeah, no worries. So um, yeah, as Senator Dole said, I am Alex, the uh, CLA. Um, so yeah, I was unfortunately on vacation, so I got to miss the first few, but uh, glad to be here. Great. All right. And actually, I think one of our committee pages was out of the room when uh, we first did introductions. Andrew, uh, so just come wave at everyone. So he's the guy who can run, get you copies if you need them. For, all right. All right. Uh, thank you, Colonel Langer. Um, uh, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Mr. Chair, members, my name is Matt Langer. I have the honor and privilege of serving as chief of the Minnesota State Patrol. Uh, my job here is just to really succinctly go through the budget requests of the Minnesota State Patrol that are before this committee. The first one is a deficiency request tied to this fiscal year only at $6.8 million. That's to alleviate some real cost pressures that we have that are byproducts of the last legislative session that didn't provide uh, the funding that we needed to enter into the fiscal year. So lo and behold, we do have a, a significant deficiency of $6.8 million. That's mainly because of pattern settlement contract increases for wages, the price of vehicles, and the price of fuel. Um, and we can document all those things if anyone has additional questions about it. But that's a very real deficiency that's impacting every day in our budget world right now that um, hopefully um, can grow some urgency here as your committee continues the work that you're doing. The second is the State Patrol Aviation request. This is for a new twin-engine helicopter to add to the current fleet of two single-engine helicopters. It also includes funding for four additional trooper pilots, some additional money for hangar space insurance and the fuel maintenance costs. But the twin-engine helicopter, I know that matter has been before this committee in the past. That greatly increases our ability to do search and rescue. The biggest advantage is it does allow us to do 
do nighttime search and nighttime rescue with the hoist versus the long line um, missions that we currently do with the two single engine helicopters. It flies a little bit higher, flies a little bit faster. The twin engine adds significant safety um, versus the single engine that we have right now as well. The additional work we've done around the metropolitan area although it's not limited to the metropolitan area, related to the, the vehicle pursuit mitigation uh, has really been helpful. We fly about 25% more than we have in the past and have done some intentional work to have local agencies, cops, deputies, and our troopers and dispatchers understand how that aviation asset can really provide value to public safety. The next slide talks about commercial vehicle enforcement. For lack of a better term, this is a federal match opportunity. So for us to access the federal funds, we need additional state dollars. So that money would go toward the, the existing program to be enhanced on the education and enforcement side of all things related to commercial vehicles. And the last piece that I'll cover today is the State Patrol accreditation. Uh, similar to what the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension is seeking through the, through the Judiciary Committee, the State Patrol seeks to get funds basically for FTEs to be able to help us work through what is, in all honesty, a very laborious, lengthy, complicated, time-intensive process to become accredited. Um, it's not uh, easy and it takes a long time, but it would focus on the organization as a whole. It would focus on our dispatch center operations and it would also focus on our academy environment. So there'd be three pieces that tie together toward uh, the CALEA accreditation process. Happy to answer any questions, Mr. Chair, if you have them now or as we continue. Questions, uh, Senator Drzezinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I just want to stand in support of, of the operating deficiency and, and the aviation. I have been involved with those for the last couple of years, and I really understand the importance of those. So thank you, Colonel Lang, for having that. I, again, I just I think the helicopter, uh, the new twin engine, I'm sure Senator Lang can talk about all the uh, great things about that uh, over what we have right now, but I think those are two very important uh, items you discussed, both the deficiency and having the aviation uh, force to help us with what's going on in Minnesota and Minneapolis right now. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Zasinski. Members, anything for Colonel Langer? All right, thank you. All right, looks like we have Mr. Hansen up next. All right. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Dibble and members, and good afternoon. My name is Mike Hansen, and I have the privilege of serving as the director for the Department of Public Safety's Office of Traffic Safety. I have three items to uh, brief you on today that are contained within our budget recommendation. The first one is funding that will support traffic safety project improvements across the state, as well as the Traffic Safety Advisory Council. The additional funds will uh, provide the backbone uh, that will support the advisory council and the efforts that the advisory council uh, recommends for localized traffic safety improvement projects. This is an integral part of the Toward Zero Deaths program and is actually going to be a part of the reorganization of the Toward Zero Deaths program uh, that our partners at the Department of Transportation and the Department of Health have been working on for about the last 18 months. And with this funding uh, that has never been present before, it will really allow us to empower our local safe roads coalitions and our Toward Zero Deaths regional coordinators to make those local changes and, and those local improvements that will make traffic safety uh, better for all citizens of the state of Minnesota. And uh, lastly, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention the fact that uh, it will provide us with additional funding that we can use to match additional federal funding that is in the pipeline, uh, thanks to the IJA Act, which was passed last summer by the U.S. Congress. Um, the OTS traffic safety behavioral uh, budget is going to go up by about 20 percent, and so that's going to bring in some substantial additional federal funds, and we do have to have state funding in order to match that and qualify for those various grants. The second item, uh, there is a traffic safety data analytics center. Right now, there's a lot of different sets of data that are available for us to analyze and for our researchers within OTS, within MnDOT, the Department of Health, the University of Minnesota, um, and even private ent entities to take a look at and analyze the who, what, when, where, why, and how of traffic crashes, why they're happening, and what we can do to prevent them. 
The challenge that we have is each of these data sets tends to exist on their own, and there's not the ability to connect these data in any real meaningful way so that we can leverage all of the data out there to really take our analytics and our research to the next level to identify really what it's going to take to get us off of the plateau or the increasing trend line that we've seen in the last couple of years for the number of fatalities and serious injuries that are taking place uh, across the state of Minnesota. This is really going to position us to be at the, the leading edge of traffic safety analytics, not only in Minnesota, but in the country. And then last, uh, the item is for a uh, authorization for a pilot project uh, that the Office of Traffic Safety will uh, develop and roll out with uh, the cooperation of our partners at the State Patrol and other law enforcement agencies across the state. And basically what we're looking at doing is testing and evaluating and eventually certifying instruments that can be used at roadside to evaluate a driver who is impaired by something other than alcohol. It's basically a preliminary screening test, much in the same way that the alcohol PBT is used by law enforcement today to determine that alcohol is the impairing substance that somebody may be under the influence of. Over 20 other states are currently utilizing this technology, and for us to move forward and to get a better understanding of how prevalent the drug-impaired driving issue and the multi-substance-impaired driving issue is on Minnesota roads, this pilot project will give us that data, it will give us that baseline, and will help us to know what we don't know. Mr. Chair, thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Hansen. I do have a question. And that's this last item, the roadside testing for drug-impaired drivers pilot project in Senator Port's bill, which we're going to hear shortly. Um, there's something similar in, in that initiative. You don't have to answer the question today, but um, uh, we should make sure that those two provisions either work well together or we do one and not the other or the other and not the one because it sounds like they're very similar to each other. So we just, uh, so we're not like, crossing over each other with the initiative in Senator Port's bill and this initiative. Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I believe these are the same provisions that are in the cannabis bill. We wanted to make sure it had multiple paths to move. Um, we'll, we'll ensure it's either in uh, your budget bill or, as I imagine you would prefer, in my cannabis bill that you don't have to pay for. I would love that. <laughs> Uh, members, questions for Ms. Hansen. Uh, Senator Lang. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess, uh, Ms. Hansen, I guess my, uh, you talked about the tra Traffic Safety Improvement and Governing Council, and I just piqued a little bit of interest on my part about traffic uh, roadway fatalities in the state of Minnesota. And uh, I guess it's kind of a two-pronged question where if, I don't know the answer if the number has gone down or up, but if it's gone down, what are some of the significant uh, items that the state has used to make those traffic safety improvements, and if the number has gone up, where are we lacking? Mr. Hansen. Mr. Chair and Senator Lang, that's a great question, and it's, it's really, it's almost two-part in the answer. Um, since about 2012, our numbers have really kind of stagnated in that 350 to 400 range. But from 2003 until about 2012, we were able to make some rather significant progress in reducing the number of fatalities from well over 600 to, you know, that 350 plus or minus range. What happened in 2020, though, is that trend reversed significantly, and that reversal continued into 2021, and then we were able to claw back some of that in 2022. So in, in 2021, 488 Minnesotans lost their lives on Minnesota roads, which was almost 100 more than in 2019. When we look at 2022, our preliminary numbers are right around 442. So we're still way above that five-year average. And there's a number of causes, but we know what the four primary drivers are, that speed, impairment, lack of wearing seatbelts, and distraction. Um, and those are the things that we're focused on. But what has worked, or what we saw early on and since the formation of the Toward Zero Deaths initiative, is that community engagement and the partnerships that we have built across the traffic safety arena, bringing together multiple disciplines to solve tough traffic safety issues. So engineering worked with enforcement, which worked with education, which works with our EMS providers, so that when something bad happens, we have great quality medical uh, services uh, to get to the scene quickly and take care of those victims in an appropriate way. 
So that's probably a long answer uh, to your question, but uh, kind of a, a quick summation of traffic safety over the last 20 years. Senator Lang. Uh, I guess the only thing I would say to that is, you know, this is the, uh, the, the policy and spending money uh, portion of the transportation uh, area of the state of Minnesota's legislature. So as we sit in this room, uh, sit behind the table asking you these tough questions, what what do we do? I mean, you have a top list of safety improvement items that we could help you with. Mr. Hansen. Mr. Chair, Senator, uh, another great question. And I think the foundation for that lies with the recommendation in the governor's budget uh, for the funding that will support the traffic safety improvement projects along with the governor or with the, the safety council uh, or the advisory council that will come with that. Um, and then building on that, the data analytics center that I, I mentioned before uh, as well, that is really going to feed into those advisory council meetings and help to guide those conversations, help us identify those countermeasures that will not just reduce but will prevent these crashes from occurring in the first place. Um, our, our state money budget right now is about a million dollars a year. Half of that goes to the maintenance for the crash record system, and we use about $500,000 of that for our planning and administration, and that's our matching funds that we have currently. But that's the only state funding we have. The vast majority of the highway safety funding that we utilize in Minnesota, we get from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Members, anything further for Mr. Hansen? All right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Next we have, uh, looks like, uh, Office of Pipeline Safety, John Wolfgram. Welcome. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, committee members. My name is John Wolfgram. I'm the Deputy Director with the Office of Pipeline Safety. Thanks for uh, hearing more information about our policy here today. And Mr. Wolfgram, if you could lean a little bit closer to the Certainly. microphone. Thanks. Is that a little better? All right. Again, well, our policy or our budget proposal here primarily focuses on the Office of Pipeline Safety's oversight of our state damage prevention laws or our call before you dig laws. These are the laws that are, are built into statute to ensure that people are safe anytime there's digging around underground utilities. It builds out a process where it, that works something similar to this where if there was a telecom line being installed by a contractor in front of your home or business, basically that contractor has to notify by a state uh, notification center or go for state one call. Basically, that allows all the utility companies to know that there's going to be digging in the area, allows those utility companies to come out and mark underground pipelines, uh, telecom lines, electric lines, the city sewer and water. Basically, that allows the contractor to know where the location of these facilities are prior to them digging. Unfortunately, we do see damages occur to these utilities. On average, the Office of Pipeline Safety receives 1,800 util utility damage reports each year. In addition, we do uh, receive increasing complaints regarding the ability of utility companies to respond to these locate requests. Utility damages can lead to service outages, uh, property damage, environmental impact, injuries, and even fatalities. The Office of Pipeline Safety is specifically requesting a dedicated funding source to be utilized by three FTE to carry out education, investigation of damages or complaint resolution, as well as carrying out any enforcement necessary. Office of Pipeline Safety staff would also carry out educational activities throughout the state, whether it would be providing education to contractors and utility companies or providing education to members of the public. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions the committee might have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wolfgram. Uh, questions for Mr. Wolfgram members? All right. Thank you very much. All right. Director Zhang, who we see a lot or yeah, probably the, probably the, we probably should keep track and see who gets the prize for the most appearances in our committee. I think, I think you'll get it. All right, welcome, uh, Director Zhang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Bong Zhang, Director of the Driver and Vehicle Services Division. And I know you're not supposed to have favorites, but, but I understand. <laughs> um, thank you for having me today. I'm just here to talk about a couple of the uh, budget proposals that, that we have in, in the governor's budget proposal. The first of which is to make permanent the, the temporary funding we received to reopen all 93 exam stations. Uh, this funding has allowed us to maintain our efficiency, increase our efficiencies in FY20 or calendar year 22. We actually had a record number of, of road tests, both in class D and in CDL. Uh, this funding will continue, will allow us to continue that and, and offer that service to Minnesotans. 
Uh, the next proposal is to increase the number of vehicle inspection sites. This is another uh, big need for Minnesotans. We, uh, we know that uh, we're not in enough spaces throughout Minnesota, and we know that we need to offer more vehicle inspections. This will allow us to bring in uh, 12 new inspectors and open five inspection sites. Uh, this next proposal is to eliminate the out-of-state knowledge test. This is an IAR recommendation, and this is uh, will allow uh, transplants into Minnesota to more easily obtain their uh, Minnesota driver's license um, if they're coming in with uh, already with a driver's license from another state. This next proposal is to uh, offer online renew an online renewal opportunity for customers uh, every other renewal cycle. Um, uh, we, this really is, an, our, our intention is here is to create an opportunity for Minnesotans to, uh, Minnesotans to interact with DVS in the way that best meets their needs. And um, by offering an online renewal process, uh, we think that we will be able to better serve Minnesotans the way that they want to be served. Uh, these next two proposals have been before this committee, and so I'll just uh, really briefly cover them. Then. And the first of which is the race and ethnicity on, on the DVS application. Uh, this will allow for the collection of data and sharing with OTS to, to further provide that analysis. And then DL for all, which has also been heard in this committee. This, these next couple of uh, proposals are revenue generators. Um, this first one is to combine the DSOA and VSOA uh, accounts so that it become a, a single appropriation. Uh, this will still allow for this body to, to appropriate the funding uh, necessary to each of the arms of DVS, but it will simplify the process in which uh, we expend those, those monies. The blackout special plate is a revenue generator. This is something that our neighbors to the south have done successfully, and uh, we we look forward to providing a special plate that that has been uh, that we think will generate a lot of interest and bring in some revenue to the, to the VSOA account. Uh, the third proposal on here is to allow for the sharing of, of social security numbers to the Department of Revenue for uh, debt collection. Uh, right now, the Department of Driver and Vehicle Services is carrying about $2 million in debt uh, that we're unable to collect because we cannot share the SSN number with, uh, with revenue. This next proposal is to reinstate the 75 cent uh, real ID surcharge that sunsetted in uh, June of 22. Uh, we, this funding is necessary to continue to pay for the, for the increased cost of, of, of uh, um, processing these transactions. The, this next proposal is to increase the credential fees, uh, the driver or the credential fees, which is driver's license and IDs, uh, by six dollars across the board. This will allow for revenues to really match the expenditures that come out of this account, and and uh, maintain the health of that account over over the the next few several years. And then this last uh, proposal is to uh, is from the IER. Um, report which really makes uh, the increases the filing fee for uh, for real IDs from uh, from uh, eight dollars to sixteen dollars and a standard um, ID from eight to eleven, and these are the fees that our business partners and our and uh, the state collects um, in processing transactions. And with that, I'm happy to stand for any questions. Uh, thank you, Director Zhang. Um, I'll just mention members uh, who might not be familiar with the expression IER, that's the Independent Expert Review, um, which was uh, a panel that was headed by uh, Rick King from Thomson Reuters, um, who's helped us with a number of examinations and, and uh, thoughts around um, technology issues and driver and vehicle services, uh, driver, driver systems, et cetera. We asked him to take a look um, at, a, at a whole array of issues pertaining to um, uh, both vehicle and driver transactions as handled by the agency, as, as handled by our deputy registrars. And he came back with a, a long roster of recommendations that's in the IER report, um, which then was um, transformed into a legislative proposal last year. Um, and we arrived at a package of, of agreements towards the end of the year. Senator Draczynski is helping uh, lead up uh, the effort to, to dust all of that off and bring, a, bring that proposal back to us in the hopefully not too distant future. Um, so I just thought I would give that little background and primer on that subject. Questions for Director Zhang members? Um, I'll go with Senator Draczynski and then Senator Carlson. Senator. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Deputy uh, Commissioner Zhang. 
Uh, so again, I, I approve of the, or look forward to the f increasing the fees because I know we've had a lot of discussion about a lot of work has been put on our deputy registers that wasn't done before. It used to be done in the back office, as we call it, and now more and more is being done by the deputy registers. So I, I applaud that and then look forward to seeing that because I know there's a lot of deputy registers that have been struggling. But can you tell me, I, I had heard there was an, uh, four offices that have closed in Minnesota. Is that correct to your knowledge? So, Senator Jasinski, four deputy registrar offices? Correct. Okay. Uh, uh, Director Zhang. Mr. Chair, Senator Jasinski, um, I, I can, I, let me confirm the actual number, but it was, there were at, le at least three that I recall in, the, in this last calendar year that closed. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, the concern is, you know, these folks can't increase their fees. Uh, they can only control, try to control the expenses, and, and there's been a lot more expense by them doing a lot more work. So usually I'm not a fan of, of fee increases, uh, but in this case I think it's warranted because otherwise we're going to end up with more office. And maybe it's four total, three this year, one last year, but it's a definite concern. Uh, many, many testifiers have talked about how important our local deputy registers are, uh, so I want to make sure that we can do what we can do to keep our deputy registrar's offices out there and look at the fee structure on how that's done because I think more and more is getting pushed online. Uh, but what's happening is the easy transactions are being pushed online and more complicated transactions are going out to our districts where these people have to deal with the, the more complicated issues and still make the same fee that usually a transaction takes way longer because there's complications to it. So again, I, I really want to talk about the importance of this fee increase for our deputy registers and, and look forward to that IER uh, type of or IER sling of bills that we're going to get through to, to ad address those issues. So thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Deputy Commissioner, for uh, talking about that. Great. Thank you. Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Director Young, I've, I've got a question on your uh, race and ethnicity information on the DVS applications. Uh, and that would be on all renewals as well, so eventually we'll have a, uh, that'll be presented to every person that uh, renews their driver's license. And I guess uh, uh, multiple small questions as part of that. Uh, how will that data be handled? And will it um, be private data and not put onto the driver's license, not recorded on the recorded information on the driver's license, but it'll, it'll be accessible to researchers, I'm, uh, I'm trusting, uh, that are looking for the kinds of things that we've always wanted to get on uh, stoppage and uh, um, no, just plain numbers. Is, am I correct on those assumptions? Director Jean. Mr. Chair, Senator Carlson, that is correct. Uh, every application that comes in, new and renewals, will, um, if, if this bill passes, will uh, be provided an opportunity to opt in their race and ethnicity data um, to which we would collect, and it would be considered private data. It would not be marked on the credential anywhere, um, and it actually won't be shared with law enforcement either in its um, individual form or private form. Uh, it will be c classified under Chapter 13 as private data and, in, and out, uh, under which it could be collected in summary form and shared and that's part of the request that we're, we're asking for is to um, uh, uh, FTE or FTEs to do that work to collect and summarize uh, that data. And I might have missed one of the other questions. I think you got them all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Members, anything further for Director Zhang? All right. Much appreciated. Thank you so much. All right. I think that was that might be it. Anything else, uh, Commissioner Jacobson? Uh, <clears throat> no, but uh, thank you, Chair, members of the committee. Appreciate the time to be here. Thank you. All right. And Mr. Haldalter, how do you make an excellent AV assistant? <laughs> all right. All right, so members, um, with that, um, uh, we are going to move, move to agency bills. And I think I'm up first, so let me grab my stuff. And uh, we'll have Vice Chair Morrison take the gavel. Mr. Chair, welcome to the testifier's table. Would you like to present your bill? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, uh, thank you, um, uh, Madam Chair and members, for the opportunity to present Senate file number 1335, 
which is the first of our Department of Public Services, um, what we call agency bills, agency initiatives. Um, and uh, members, if you recall, we tried to get to this bill on our school bus day, but uh, that was a busy, packed agenda. Um, so I will, uh, members, this has, um, this bill has five elements, five major elements to it. Um, and I'll just describe them very briefly and then rely on my good friend here, Colonel Matt Langer, um, to maybe do a little further context setting. And um, then we'll stand for questions. So uh, what this bill would do would um, edit existing statutes to change uh, school bus and Head Start bus inspection certificates uh, from displaying the date of inspection by a member of the state patrol to displaying the month of the inspection and to state that the certificate is valid for 12 months after the month specified. So like I said, very detailed uh, uh, elements. Um, it uh, has, it changes existing statutes to clarify that uh, if a school bus has a defect uh, that makes it unsafe for student transportation and has been so labeled that, um, uh, and a rejection sticker has been placed on the windshield, um, the bus may be used uh, for 30 days if those defects have been corrected um, and the vehicle examination report has been signed. Of course, um, a reinspection, et cetera, would have to occur so that that sticker can be changed at some point. Um, it uh, goes on to say that if, in fact, a school bus uh, with a rejection sticker has been placed and um, that school bus continues to be driven, and just catch me if I say anything wrong, um, if the school bus continues to be driven um, without the correction, that violation would, would be um, rather than a misdemeanor, as it is today, would become a gross misdemeanor. Um, it would uh, edit uh, existing statutes um, to clarify that uh, when there is an obstruction on the driver's rearview mirror, um, because the, the reason for this change is because we know of a number of things now that are happening with school bus cameras, et cetera. Um, simply put, we need to be sure that the driver can actually see in their rear view mirror. So there's some elements that speak to, to that. And then finally, there's something that's highly technical that I completely don't understand. It has to do with the federal code of regulations, references, et cetera. I think that's very highly technical. With that, I will suspend and uh, refer to Colonel Matt Langer, who knows a lot more about the details of this bill. Colonel Langer, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, Madam uh, Chair and members of the committee, my name is Matt Langer. I have the honor and privilege of serving as Chief of the State Patrol. Uh, Chair Dibble, Senator Dibble, thank you for covering that. I'll just clarify just a couple of things, kind of putting it in, into plain language. Uh, about eight times last year, the State Patrol found a school bus on the road that was operating with a defect sticker. And so what that means is the bus company intentionally put that school bus back on the road before they had fixed a defect that one of our inspectors had found. Um, so uh, I see some grimaces. Anyone that puts a kid on a school bus would have that grimace because the parents didn't know, then the kids didn't know. Uh, the vast majority of carriers, carriers are wonderful to work with. Our inspectors do a great job. We inspect every single school bus in the state every single year as part of our work. And we just simply don't want a bus that has a defect and was placed out of service to be put back into service. We want to stand with those operators and make sure that doesn't happen. So that increase, we think, is really important. And then the rear view mirror, just to clarify, um, I think Chair Dibble did a wonderful job of explaining that. I'll just add one piece to that, that it's every vehicle right now. There's technology that allows, rather than a mirror, to provide the view behind you. It's actually a video feed that provides the mirror behind you. So there are some applications that we're seeing coming on fast and, and strong, especially in the commercial vehicle world. We just don't want current state law to inhibit or prohibit uh, that technology from being available and being used in Minnesota. So that would be that change in the, as Section 5, as uh, Senator Dibble uh, mentioned, that cross-reference is just a really simple error fixing one letter to make sure that it's correct. It's just an incorrect cross-reference right now. It doesn't actually change anything. So Madam Chair. Uh, Chair Dibble. I will respond now to questions or amendments. Members, discussion. 
Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Dibble. Thank you for bringing this forward. I think parts of this is a bill that I carried last year, so it's uh, good to finally get it across, or hope to get it across the finish line. Uh, some very important stuff, and especially when we're talking about school sa safety uh, with our children. So uh, thank you again for bringing the bill forward, and thank you, Colonel Langer, for your testimony. Further discussion? Senator Lang. Thanks, Madam Chair. I just, well, I guess I was going to ask, and you asked the, or you answered the question I was going to ask initially, is this, is this has ever happened? But obviously, if it happened eight times, I guess the concern is there if it happened eight times and they willfully did it, was it just a uh, miss of paperwork or was it a big blaring orange sticker that they said, you know what, we don't care? And then what's the ramification of that? What's the, what's the, what happens to the bus company? Colonel Lang. Uh, ma Madam Chair and Senator Lane, great question. So it can run the gamut from a simple oversight. We're certainly not concerned with someone as much who fixed a repair and failed to follow up with the procedure after that. What we are very worried about is a case where a bus company might have 12 buses and they use 12 buses every day and one of them was put out of service. We'd rather figure out a way for that company to do their work in any way possible other than putting that one bus back into service that shouldn't be uh, into service until it's fixed. So you'll notice under the law they can make the fix and then sign and operate it immediately before it's reinspected. So we don't slow them down at all. All we're trying to do is put a little bit more teeth in the law to say that if one of our inspectors puts a school bus out of service, it cannot transport kids until it's been fixed. Further discussion members? Seeing none, all those in favor? Or do you have, did you want to have a concluding comment, Chair Dibble? Oh, yes, uh, thanks. No, no, Madam Chair, appreciate the, uh, the um, questions and, and the uh, indications of support. And, and I would just simply move Senate file number 1335 be recommended to pass and be referred to the Senate floor. Thank you, Chair. And with that, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, pass, uh, Senate file 1335 passes and we'll go to the floor from here. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. All right, next up we have Senator Herr with Senate file one, three, three, six. Senator Herr, welcome to the table. Thank you, Chair Dib Dibble and members. Um, Senate File 1336 is an agency bill. Uh, this bill contains several policy and technical changes related to the DVS. Uh, many of these were heard in this committee last year and some are new. This bill clarifies several areas of statute including language around veterans license plates and personalization fees. It also expands the types of documentation that can be used to demonstrate residency, residency for purpose of a real ID and repeals the pro prohibition on sharing motor vehicle data over the phone. Um, Mr. Chair, members, um, I have here uh, Director Pong Xiong uh, from Driver and Vehicle Services to uh, testify and walk us to the provision of the bill. Welcome, Director Xiong. Welcome back. Please introduce yourself for the record and uh, proceed with the presentation of Senate File 1336. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, Pong Zhang, Director of the Driver and Vehicle Services Division. And thank you, Senator Herr, for, for carrying this bill. Um, I'll just qu quickly walk through the provisions. Um, under Section 1, this is a correction to, um, to list disabled American veterans as a congressionally chartered veteran service. Uh, to clarify, DVS does allow for that, the, those special plate applications to come through. This correction will just reflect uh, our current practice in allowing that. Um, the other two congressionally, congressionally chartered are the American Legion and the VFW. Um, the next, Section 2 uh, covers the Gold Star family plate and uh, we currently, uh, this is another clarification, we currently do not charge the $100 for a customized custom plate. Uh, this correction will allow us to continue to do that and have that reflect in the law. 
uh, on Section 3 is a, is a clarification to a, an outdated practice where the Department of Public Safety could offer a different application to obtain a U.S. DOT number. That, that process no longer exists, and this is just to clarify the Minnesota language to reflect that new federal process. Uh, sections four and six make changes to a uh, language around related to dealers, and so this really um, creates some more clarity around when we deny applications, and also creates some clarity for when dealers have to be open um, for inspection, so that when our de our examiners or inspectors go out there, that they're also there, and and we can efficiently go through those um, go through those inspections. This also increases the, the temporary license from 120 to 180, 180 days, giving those dealers a little bit more time to come into compliance um, before that final inspection. Uh, section five uh, uh, removes the word customarily from, um, from uh, vehicles, uh, deal, tow trucks, service trucks, and, and uh, parts vehicle use. Uh, just really, it's, it's really ambiguous language and, and uh, removing that, the, that uh, word allows us to just more clearly enforce that uh, so that uh, vehicles are properly registered. Uh, section seven is, is, uh, removes uh, the requirement for uh, uh, submitting for an applicant to submit qualified driver's license when a when a um, uh, a, a plate has been impounded. Uh, this is really commonly known as the whiskey plate, and this really is is uh, duplicative in that uh, Minnesota law already requires you to have a driver's license to drive a vehicle. So collecting that data at the point of the application for a, a whiskey plate is really uh, unnecessary. Uh, sections 8 and 12 uh, provides uh, applicants an opportunity to designate a, an that they are an exclusive caretaker for another individual, and very much like uh, drivers can uh, and can indicate that uh, their emergency contact. This ensures that law enforcement professionals have access to data when uh, the driver themselves or the person on the, the credential owner themselves are the primary caretakers of another individual, and allows for. Um, a law enforcement to contact those uh, or that next um, in line to, to, to support that individual. Uh, sections nine, um, section nine uh, really uh, extends the Snowbird application to incarcerated individuals. Right now, if you're, uh, we, uh, DVS offers a one-time uh, Snowbird application where um, um, applicants can remotely renew their, their driver's license. This extends that to those who are incarcerated for a one-time renewal uh, while they're incarcerated in a, in a non-DOC custodial facility. Uh, Section 10 corrects an error in the Real ID statute, um, and it's really a clarification of, of the prohibition of using out-of-state Real ID um, a credential as a source document. Uh, Real ID requires you to pr provide new primary and secondary documents, and, and a real ID from another state is, is not an acceptable uh, credential under, under federal law, and this really clarifies that in Minnesota law. And then uh, Section 11, uh, um, as Senator Herr already uh, kind of alluded to, these are the additional documents that we are recommending for inclusion. Under the Real ID Act, uh, the states are responsible for identifying which documents are to be leveraged in, in a Real ID application. And so we are including a health savings account uh, statement, a retirement account statement, a student summary report from a high school um, signed uh, by the principal or designated authority, an affidavit of residence for a group home, cooperative or religious order, assisted living or nursing home statement, um, and internet and, uh, or cable as a utility bill. And then lastly, section 13. Um, repeals two outdated provisions, uh, the first of which is uh, the restriction to uh, provide motor vehicle data, even public data, over the phone. Uh, this is just an, uh, an antiquated uh, uh, provision in the, in, the, in, the in the statute, and uh, a removal will allow for not only DVS, but our deputy registrar partners to, do, to better serve Minnesotans um, over the phone. Um, and then this other provision, uh, it removes uh, the use of an applicant's uh, opt in to use a, a maiden name in lieu of their middle name, and it was—it's just another piece of uh, of statute that um, 
can't be can't apply or doesn't work in today's current modernized system because of our verification with, with legal names, um, uh, opting in a, a maiden name or a different name other than their legal name creates challenges in that process, and this cleans up that language. And with that, I'm happy to stand for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Director Zhang. Questions, uh, members? All right, uh, Senator Lang. I, I got a couple. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Director, I don't know if this is the right bill. I, I know of the last couple of years we've talked about, oh, there's been a few things like air metal plates uh, was a, a topic of conversation with Senator Newton prior to this year, and there was some sticker discussion for some of those collector vehicles. Uh, you mentioned the whiskey plates. Is any of that included in this bill, or is it? Is this is this a different section of law we're looking at? Director Zhang. Mr. Chair, Senator Ling, uh, none of the provisions that you just uh, listed off are, are in this. These are really our policy co corrections. Okay. Senator Ling. In, thank you, Mr. Chair. And then uh, let's see, on line 3.24, you mentioned the, I got to ask, a, a license uh, may be denied if a dealer is not in compliance. Uh, what's, the, what's the story behind that? What's the impediments that, that, in, impediments that started this, this section of law? There's got to be a story there, right? Somebody violated Senator something Lane, is someplace it 3. in the process. 3.14, is that? I'm sorry, 3.24. 3.24. So it says, a uh, license may be denied if a dealer is not in compliance with location requirements, et cetera. Director Zhang. Mr. Chair, Senator Lang, yes. Um, the, what we're trying to clear up here is that um, dealers who, who we come back to inspect and have not made the corrections after we have uh, provided them uh, with the, the corrections that need to be made. It just really clearly gives us the authority to deny that application, and which was an ambiguous in, in the language before. Senator Lang. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. So there, there is incidents where this has happened where you've, and they've intentionally misled? Director Zhang. Mr. Chair, Senator Lang. Um, the, the corrections that, uh, for as an example, and a correction that we can we have identified that uh, may may illustrate this is that uh, there's a certain size requirements for a sign or parking spots that need to be av made available, and on their application they say that the sign is of that size or or their parking number of parking spots available. We come make the inspection and and those are not there or not true, and. Um, you know, we use the language intentionally mis misled, but uh, it really is that the, the application doesn't match what's being, what's the information that um, is being presented. So, if I could try, Senator Lang. Has this actually happened? I think is his question. Do we have examples? Is, we're, we're solving a problem in the real world. Mr. Chair, correct. That is, that is a problem in the real world that we're trying to solve. All right. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Senator Jasinski. He stole my thunder on that, so I'm sorry. But, uh, that was my uh, thought also, because I thought last year we had put the word intentionally in there. Um, so I, I do have an A2 amendment, uh, if they want to uh, disperse the, or, or pass out the A2 amendment, which deals with this. And if I can, I can talk about it, or I can have staff go through it as well. Basically, on page three, line 25, after has, it inserts intentionally. And then there's a technical amendment after that on page five, on lines two, four, eight, and nine, uh, that uh, strikes shell and inserts must. And I think this was a part of the auto dealers last night. I had some concerns over the intentionally, as Senator Lang had talked about. Um, but uh, with that, I'd appreciate a yes vote on the A2 amendment. And um, on the, the shall versus must, I think that's... Just um, that's something we do when we find that word shall, right? We just, you know, ask council. Don't we, are we on a mission to eliminate all the shalls in statute and uh, turn them all to musts? That's a bigger <laughs> yeah. uh, Mr. Chair, that's, that's the intention here is just cleaning up some shalls and making them into musts. Because shall is, believe it or not, sounds certain, but it's actually an ambivalent word, and must is a clearer word. Mr. Greenfield already knows that. He's already nodding. No, no shalls in your writing. <laughs> okay. Um, but to um, uh, the, the meat of the amendment is uh, line two. 
uh, inserting intentionally. Um, Senator Her or Director Zhang, um, what is your response? Uh, I'm sure, uh, like, it's okay to accept this uh, amendment. All right, so Senator Her recommends that we accept the A2. Any discussion, members? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. Anything, anything further, members? Senator Lang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have, uh, I, I don't know if it was an intentional by the author. I don't, I don't think so, but I do have the A1 amendment to offer as well. This is something, uh, as going through the bill, it was something that uh, we were talking about. Uh, Mr. Chair, and really what it does is when it talks about an incarcerated individual and the opportunity for them uh, to apply online, it just gives the rest of us that are not incarcerated to uh, do the same thing. Taking a moment to engross. So. <laughs> All right. So, um, so Senator Lang. Um, this just simply removes the language that modifies the remote application provision so to incarcerated individuals so that this is a process that would be available for anyone. So, all right. So, um, uh, Senator Her or um, Mr. Director Mr. Jean, Chair, what yeah. is your response? Um, I, I would uh, reject this amendment uh, and like uh, Director Zhang to explain why. Director Zhang. Mr. Chair, uh, and Senator Lang, thank you for this um, uh, suggestion. We are proposing uh, uh, this for the general population in a different portion of, the, of our budget proposal. And so this really, uh, um, we carved this out specifically for incarcerated ind individuals. So I, I seem to recall that you had a proposal when you presented the governor's budget proposal that folks, every other time they renewed would be uh, allowed or would be permitted to renew online. So once every eight years, they would have an online driver renewal process available to them. Correct, Mr. Chair, uh, th this, uh, this specific provision is a one-time provision. You can do this once, you can use this once. The, the budget proposal that we have in the governor's bill is every other renewal cycle, you could do this online. All right, thank you. Anything further, members? Uh, Mr. Chair, I think I'll, I'll make it easy on you. I'll withdraw it. Okay. All right, Senator Lang withdraws the A1. Anything further on uh, Senate File 1336, members? All right, with that. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And just looking down, so on, I believe it's online, you refer to as 12.14, or I'm sorry, let's see. About the caretaker and, and not being able to charge a fee. So. You're basically making our deputy registers do a transaction and not collect a fee. Again, my concern with our deputy registers is, you know, they're limited on their fees, and now you're telling them they got to do a, a service and not charge a fee. And uh, uh, many of these are private businesses. Uh, many are city-run uh, offices, and many are county-run offices. Uh, so just asking why we're not charging a fee. So I'm sorry, Senator Jasinski, can you point us, uh, point us to that line again, I'm, I'm line 12.10 to 12.13. Uh, person who's provided caretaker information on this subdivision may change, add, or delete information time, but it says they cannot charge a fee. The commissioner of the driver's license agent or driver's license agent may not charge a fee for the transaction. Thank you, uh, Director Zhang or Senator. Director Zhang. 
Mr. Chair, Senator Jasinski, uh, then our intent here is to uh, create a low barrier or no cost transaction to update caretaker information should that need to change on their credential. Um, DVS remains open to the discussion on how we can make sure that deputy registrars are, are compensated fairly for the work that they do. Uh, the intent here was, though, to, was to create a low barrier for those who just need to make an update to, their, to that information. And Mr. Chair, again, and, I, and I understand both sides. Again, it's just more and more. Our deputy registrars are doing more and more, uh, and you're now you're not having them charge a fee. Uh, they're doing more work. Uh, so again, my frustration is our deputy registrars. Obviously, we've had three closed this year, one closed last year. Um, I know this is a small item, and I understand that. But again, we 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 got to have some concern over these deputy registers, and you're limiting their fees and not allowing them to charge fees on certain transactions. We got to be thinking about these folks. I'll look forward to uh, some ideas as we bring your package forward, Senator Jasinski. Senator Lang. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I guess I'm just curious, what kind of fee are we talking about? What's the dollar value on it? Uh, uh, Director Zhang. Mr. Chair, Senator Lang, uh, the proposal is, is to have a no, no cost if you need to update the, the caretaker information on the credential. Uh, you could also, at the time of application, included with your normal application, provide this information. This, uh, this section really here, here is to um, uh, provide us um, um, uh, a, a no-cost way for, for Minnesotans to update that information if they need to update it. So, so, so Mr. Chair, so Mr. Zhang, uh, Director Zhang, bear with me for a minute. This is a new section of law. You're not going to have a fee. If you were going to have a fee, what would it look like? And I know you don't speak for all the DVS, but let's just pretend. Is it a $5 fee or is it a $100 fee? That's what, kind of what I'm asking. Director Zhang, do you have a guess how much something like this might cost <laughs> if someone were to come in and ask for their caretaker credential to be changed on their existing ID or driver's license? Mr. Chair, Senator Lang, uh, I think it's really difficult to put a dollar amount on that um, transaction. Uh, th there is a filing fee associated with a credential. Um, and, and that could be one that, that we could justify. Um, I think it's really difficult to, to compare a full credential application with, with one with an update, um, but, but a, the most comparable fee that we have in the structure would be like a credential fee or, where you update information. Mr. Chair, Senator, Senator Lang, uh, it, it depends on the type of, of credential, but for standard class D, um, and I'm probably going to get this wrong, the team's going to get really mad at me, I believe it's $21 right now uh, for a standard class D with no other endorsements on it. All right. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right. Members, anything further? All right. So uh, Senator Herr is going to move Senate file 1336 be recommended to pass as amended and referred to the committee on judiciary. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. All right. Moving along. Senate file 1338. Senator Carlson. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, he has both. So, all right. So we'll start with 1337. Also Senator Carlson and then we'll move to Senate file 1338. Welcome to the table, Senator Carlson. One, Thank you, three, Mr. Three, Chair. Seven. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Committee. Uh, I have uh, an agency bill here, a rather simple bill, and uh, I can explain, or we can have the uh, the requester explain. Uh, but it, what it is is it's uh, um, it's some three small changes, and it, it's. Uh, you would call it very various driver and vehicle services modifications uh, with uh, three sections in it. Would you like to explain or shall I? Okay, I'll, I'll do it. <coughs> Section one is the issuance of a restricted license and it, what it does is it makes a conforming change in a subdivision relating to issuing a driver's license to a person participating in the ignition interlock device program. It adds a reference to having a license revoked pursuant to two specified sections. And what that means in uh, everyday language is that if this person has uh, had a problem with uh, um, 
with a revoked license, uh, for instance, with a DUI, they have to have a, uh, they have to go into an insurance uh, certification program before they can be enrolled in the interlock, ignition interlock um, program. Uh, section two specifies uh, that threatening or obstructing a Department of Vehicle Services employee while they're performing their legal official duties is a criminal offense. And there's, uh, I don't have uh, the breakdown of penalties in the uh, bill, but what it is, is is very typical if it's done with uh, with a uh, an intent, then it can be a up to a, a ten thousand dollar fine and uh, five years in in. Uh, let me take a look here again. Five years, no, no more than a ten thousand uh, dollar fine. Five years in prison or both. Uh, if uh, if it's in company, accompanied by force or threat of force without causing a bodily harm or serious property damage or death, uh, then it's uh, uh, one year, up to one year, and $3,000 in fine or both. And for other cases, it would be uh, up to 90 days or up to $1,000. And uh, uh, Section 3 removes the knowledge test for requirement for a driver's license reinstatement after certain insurance and drug offenses a requirement that was previously eliminated for DUIs. And any questions? I have the Director of uh, Driver and Vehicle Services here to uh, help with explanations. Thank you. Senator Ling. J just one, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, when it comes, you said Section 3 removes the uh, driver's test? Uh, Senator Carlson or Director Zhang. Mr. Chair, Senator Lang, uh, this removes the knowledge test for uh, those situations um, that, uh, for example, DUI offenders, um, uh, where folks are who have previously passed the knowledge test in Minnesota, but where um, because of these provisions are required to retake the knowledge test. Uh, this would remove those re that requirement to retake the knowledge test as part of that corrective action. So, Director Zhang, it. Uh kind of lowers the barrier for reinstatement a, a little bit. Mr. Chair, that is correct, yes. Right. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess my question is, why would we do that? Why, why would we not keep that little barrier there, maybe a little, I don't know, warm, fuzzy feeling of a, <laughs> of a thick, warm testing blanket? Why wouldn't we keep that there? Director. Mr. Chair, Senator Lang. Uh, the, we, we, we don't see the correlation from the issue of, of whatever caused that revocation to a lack of knowledge. Um, and we also, um, have, we, we also don't see the correlation of, of uh, retesting uh, this same knowledge that the, this individual has already um, proven in, uh, to obtain their driver's license as a way to address the issue for the, the revocation or the cancellation of that credential. All right, Mr. Senator Hal. Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I got a question. I'm going to go down that same line okay. uh, because I can see maybe for substance abuse, not going down that line, but when you got like that one, and, and I tell you what, I was taught early on that the proof is always in the repealer. So when I'm looking at the repealer, and it has 171.17, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that's vehicular homicide if I'm not correct. Or why would we allow them to get a, apparently they failed cons, the understanding that that's not what a vehicle is for. Why in that case, I'll give you the, maybe the substance abuse and make it the same as a, as a DUI. I, I, I can maybe get that. But when somebody used a vehicle, to do bodily harm, I think they need retraining. Uh, forgive me for thinking that's the way it is, but if they think that a vehicle is is uh, the proper use for being a weapon to kill someone or to do bodily harm, I think they need all the retraining we can give them. Thank you, Senator Howell. Uh, anything further, members? Unless uh, Senator Carlson wanted to respond. I, 
I guess, I, Mr. Chair, I would Enough. ask if, if they would respond to that because I think they should respond to using a vehicle as a weapon. I think they need the retraining, and I would like to hear their thoughts on why they believe that it shouldn't. Uh, Director Zhang. Uh, Mr. Chair, I apologize if we could repeat the question. Senator Howell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and, uh, Commissioner Zhang, if you could just explain to me why we think that someone that used a vehicle in a, in a homicide to, to do bodily harm to someone, why would we think that they don't deserve to go through retraining and retesting? Uh, to me, they need all the retraining and retesting we can give them before we put them back behind the driver's seat in a vehicle. Can you express to me why in a homicide situation where, where they're using a vehicle as a weapon that we're not going to require them to go through retraining? Director Zhang. Mr. Chair, Senator Howell, uh, we do not see the correlation from a, a lack of knowledge to that crime, uh, the, a lack of knowledge of, of the ro ro or driving rules, driving laws as um, core to that, to that crime. Mr. Chair, no. I just say I'm astounded. All right, anything further, members? Uh, Mr. Chair, I would just echo Senator Howell's comments. I mean, uh, I think if someone uses a vehicle that, that kills somebody, I think they can use some updated training. And I, I would just agree that that's astounding that the, your department does not want that. But then secondly, I'm going to go back to my deputy registers again because I, I like to protect them. Uh, same thing on, in your bill, I think, on lines uh, 3.24, uh, as far as the Department of Public Safety and Vehicle Service Division, what about our driver's license, uh, uh, driver's license agents, uh, our deputy registers? Why would they not be under the same thing uh, to have them protected as well? If someone comes after them, why would they not be protected just like someone from the driver or vehicle services division? Mr. Chair, Senator Jasinski, can you, uh, Senator Carlson, give me a give me the place where you're seeing that again? In uh, line, I believe it's 3.24 in the bill. Um, you're adding, or that it talks about uh, the force or threat endeavors obstruct the employee, a Department of Revenue, and then it adds the Department of Public Safety, Driver, and Vehicle Services Division, which again, uh, driver's license agents are very similar to that. So why would we not be protecting them as well? And I don't have an amendment, but I'd, I'd encourage maybe if we could do an oral amendment, but I, I just think our deputy registers deserve that same right as a, uh, from a person from the driver vehicle services. Gen Senator Jasinski, I agree. And maybe we can have uh, counsel give us a couple of words there. Uh, Ms. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. On page three, line 24, delete or the and insert a comma. And after division, insert comma, a driver's license agent, comma, or a deputy registrar. So that line will read, um, Department of Revenue, Department of Public Safety, Driver and Vehicle Services Division, a driver's license agent, or a deputy registrar, while the employee is lawfully engaged. All right, questions, members. All right, all in favor of the Jasinski oral amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. All right, anything further, members? All right, uh, so um, unfortunately, Senator Carlson, I have to send you to judiciary <laughs> because of that provision there. Um, so, um, Senator Carlson moves Senate file number 1337, uh, be as passed amended. and referred to the Committee on Judiciary. As amended. As amended. Yep. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. All right, moving on to Senate file number 1338, Senator Carlson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have uh, Senate file 1338, another agency bill, and uh, uh, we will have our testifier walk us through the bill for it. It's a very simple bill. All right, Mr. Hansen, please introduce yourself formally for the record and proceed with your testimony. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, again, my name is Mike Hanson, and I serve as the director for the Department of Public Safety's Office of Traffic Safety. The bill that you have before you here is a simple technical correction to statute 16909, which requires the reporting of motor vehicle crashes. And specifically, this uh, legislation applies to uh, crashes that involve a fatality. We're simply asking that law enforcement report to the Department of Public Safety within a 48 hour or two business day period uh, when they are informed that a fatality has resulted as a result of a crash. In roughly half of the fatalities out there, the death does not occur on scene. It takes place at a medical facility. And that death can take place a day, a week, or even up to 30 days after the crash occurs in order for it to be counted in our statistics. Uh, the problem becomes when that death doesn't necessarily take place in Minnesota or the crash report is filed um, in accordance with the current statute, which requires law enforcement to file their reports within 10 days. But if the death occurs after that, oftentimes we have to play catch up trying to get that accurate statistical information in real time. So by asking our law enforcement partners to let us know as soon as they know a fatality has resulted, it will allow us to be much more efficient in how we track fatalities, identify trends much quicker, and be able to take any countermeasures that might prevent another event involving a fatality from occurring uh, in that aftermath. And with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to answer any member questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hansen. Uh Senator Drzinski. Mr. Chair, I think this is a good bill, and I support it, and I have no amendments. <laughs> Anything further, members? All right. Senate File 1338. Um, I think Senator Carlson can go right to the floor. Yes. Recommended to pass, and uh, I'll All be right. referred to the floor. All right. So that is Senator Carlson's motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, um, members, we have to um, pull my, put my bill back in front of the committee uh, because uh, I think Ms. Stengel discovered that there is something that would cause me to go to, I'm very sorry to say, judiciary. <laughs> so, uh, Ms. Stengel, if you can help, uh, help us understand what element uh, causes us to go to judiciary and then help us make the right motion to put the bill back in front of us and redo it. All right. Sure. Mr. Chair. Um, thank you. It's section three of the bill, uh, 1335. And I will note that this is Mr. Greenfield's first day and he's already pointing out mistakes I'm making. So you guys will be well served with him. Um, and it has, uh, it's a new gross misdemeanor. Um, and judiciary tends to care about things like that. Um, so the motion would um, be for somebody to motion to reconsider Senate file 1335. Uh, so Senator Lang makes that motion. All we need to do. All right. And then, uh, Mr. Chair, somebody will need to uh, move for the bill to be recommended to pass and sent to judiciary. So do we have to take a vote on the first motion? Oh, yes, of course right. you do. Thank All you. All right. So, uh, Senator Lang moves that uh, uh, Senate file 1335. What, what is it? Uh, be reconsidered. Be reconsidered. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. And then Senator Lang moves that Senate file 1335, regrettably, is recommended to pass. Was it amended? Uh, and uh, referred to the Committee on Judiciary. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. I'm glad that Mr. Greenfield has got such an eagle eye. I regret that he sees that things need to go to judiciary. That's not, never a great thing. <laughs> Our goal is to keep things out. All right, so um, we have uh, we have Senate File 73. Uh, Senate uh, File 73 is Senator Port's uh, bill on adult use cannabis. Um, members, um, there are uh, it's a 300 and some page bill. There are only a few elements that uh, bring it in front of. Transportation. Um, I did not warn uh, Senator uh, Ms. Stengel that we were going to ask her to describe those, but I bet you she knew that we would. Um, so, if you could help us understand 
the sections um, that are relevant to our transportation jurisdiction. Um, and the reason I'm asking her to do that is because I'm going to ask the public um, to confine their testimony to only those relevant sections. I'll also take this opportunity to let the public know that um, we are allowing two minutes per person uh, for public testimony. Ms. Ethier is going to time all the testimony. There, uh, there will be a sound that occurs after those two minutes, whereupon I will ask you to finish your sent the sentence that you're then speaking and conclude your testimony at that point. Ms. Stengel. Apologies, Mr. Chair, my computer is a little bit slow. Okay, I got it. So um, there are several provisions throughout Senate File 73 that are within the jurisdiction of this committee. The first is Article 1, Section 3 on line 17.10, and that is the Commissioner of Public Safety makes an appointment to the Cannabis Advisory Council. And the duties of that council are to review national cannabis policy, to look at the effectiveness of policies, review industry developments, and um, various review various studies and results. The next piece that's within the jurisdiction of this committee is Article 1, Section 29. That starts on page 63, line 23. And this has to do with a cannabis transporter license. So the Office of Cannabis Management issues a whole variety of different licenses, um, and this is the one that's in the jurisdiction of this committee. And a cannabis transporter license allows somebody to transport cannabis and related products um, between cannabis-related facilities. Section 30 is the cannabis transporter operations, and this has to do with a person or entity that has one of the transporter licenses and what they can do. Uh, including they must have a shipping manifest with them at all times, they must keep records that are available to the Office of Cannabis Management, uh, the products must be stored and locked, uh, identifying logos and business names are prohibited from showing up on the vehicles, delivery routes and dates must be randomized, only employees are allowed in the vehicle, uh, they must have a valid driver's license, and the vehicles are subject to inspection. The next is section is Article 1, Section 50, and this has to do with um, some provisions relating to medical cannabis, and specifically on 90, line 96.30, there's a penalty for vaping or smoking medical cannabis on public transportation, and then a couple of lines later on 97.5 and 97.7, there's penalties for um, operating or working on transportation property, equipment, or facilities while under the influence of medical cannabis. Next is section 58, which is on page 109, line 28, specifically subdivision two, outdoor advertisements, um, and the related definition that appears on page 11, lines five to 10, and that has to do with exactly what it sounds like, advertisements that are outdoor. There are a couple of provisions in article six, section 17, um, has to do with prohibiting, um, Sorry, let me back up. Section 16 is a general prohibition on employers from testing job applicants for cannabis in their system. That's not really in this committee's jurisdiction, but it's relevant to know for section 17, which is on page 187, starting on line 13. And this section has to do with exceptions to the general rule that prohibit testing for cannabis and for positions, um, specified positions like law enforcement, employees are subject to drug testing for cannabis, as are um, CDL, people that hold a CDL. And then finally, Article 9, Section 1, um, subdivisions 15 and 17 make appropriations, um, one from the Trunk Highway and one from the General Fund to the State Patrol for various purposes of this act. And if folks are tracking closely, um, uh, some of the page numbers were mentioned, but I'll just uh, mention them again here. Um, Section 29, I believe, is on page 63. Section 30 follows, of course, from there. I, I didn't quite catch where section 50 is. Section 58 is page 109, section 17, page 187, and in article 9, section 1, sub 15 and 17, that's set approximately page 245. All right, Senator Port, welcome. 
Thank you, Chair Dibble and committee members. I am pleased to be here with you to present Senate File 73, the Adult Use Cannabis Legalization Bill. Prohibition of cannabis is a failed system that has not achieved the desired goals and has had incredible costs for our communities, especially communities of color. We have an opportunity today to continue the process to undo some of the harm that has been done and to create a system of regulation that works for Minnesota consumers and businesses while ensuring an opportunity in this new market for communities that have been most affected by prohibition. Our main goals are to legalize, regulate, and expunge, and we are working to ensure this bill does just that. The bill establishes an Office of Cannabis Management to oversee the regulation of cannabis and cannabinoid products and transfers the medical cannabis program to the new office. It establishes a Cannabis Advisory Council, requires specific studies and reports, and sets up a statewide monitoring system. The bill also creates an approval process for cannabis, cannabinoid products, and hemp-derived con consumer products, establishes plant propagation standards and agricultural best practices, and environment standards. Additionally, the bill provides the legal lim limits for adult use cannabis products, establishes 14 categories of licensing and related fees and legal framework. We establish a social equity program to ensure communities most harmed by pro prohibition have an opportunity to engage in the industry, provide grower grants, and invest in a substance use disorder advisory council. Senate File 73 sets the tax rate for cannabis products, provides business development grant programs, sets up an automatic expungement program as well as an expungement panel for higher level offenses, and puts in a temporary regulation uh, changes needed for the products that we legalized last year. We also provide guidelines around testing, packaging, labeling, and advertising. This bill is comprehensive, to say the least, and we will absolutely have changes through this committee process from now until we see it on the floor. This is our seventh committee stop. We hope that through this process, we can work together with each other and with stakeholders to get a final product that works best for Minnesotans. I am pleased to note that members of this committee from both parties have taken me up on my invitation to discuss amendments before committee, as I think you'll see with a number of friendly amendments adopted today. Uh, today, the jurisdiction was explained by Ms. Stangle. Thank you for doing that. Um, thank you, committee, for your time. Uh, I look forward to this discussion. And Mr. Chair, I do have two amendments. Uh, Senator Port, um, uh, please offer your amendments, or please offer one amendment and then the other amendment. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I'd like to offer the A40, please. So Senator Port offers the A40. Members, I believe that is in your packets. Uh, and Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, this uh, brings into compliance. Uh, we took up an amendment earlier uh, in the committee process to allow for billboard advertising. I think Senator Dames uh, offered that amendment in commerce. Um, this uh, puts that so that those billboards have to comply with the current standards that we have in Chapter 173, um, which I'm certain Ms. Stangle could uh, inform us of what those are, um, but puts it, put it, puts it in line with what the requirements are that every other billboard has to follow. Ms. Stengel, if you could just give us just a few of the elements that uh, Chapter 173 provides for. Thanks. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Chapter 173 has to do with advertising along an interstate highway or a trunk highway, um, and it includes things like spacing or electronic billboards or those sorts of things. There are also some areas that are designated as scenic and the advertising within those areas are more restrictive. Thank you. Senator Part. And Mr. Chair, uh, the second part of the um, transporter license uh, establishes that while the committee or while the office is making these transporter license or is, is providing them out uh, through the process that they are creating these licenses and the guidelines for it, that they will do so um, in consultation with the Commissioner of Transportation about best practices. Thank you, and I think uh, we're gonna hear a little more discussion about that idea from Senator Drzezinski a little later, but for the time being, we'll adopt this language. Um, uh, questions on the A40. This is not an author's amendment in the classic sense um, because it's not the 
First Amendment offered at the first stop. So questions about the A40. All right, all in favor of the A40 say aye. Aye, opposed say no, motion carries. Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to offer the A41, please. Senator Port offers the A41 amendment, also in your packets, members. And uh, maybe Ms. Stengel can explain it because um, it's a bit of a technical cleanup that uh, was caught in council, uh, in council review of the sections that were relevant to our committee. Ms. Stengel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The original appropriation appropriated money directly to the State Patrol, and usually we appropriate to the commissioner for use by the State Patrol, and that's what this amendment does. And the other thing is it um, moves it into a paragraph with the other State Patrol appropriations, so now all the State Patrol appropriations will appear in one subdivision. All right. Questions about the A41 amendment? Senator Lang. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, and I, Senator Port, I guess this is... Uh, you know, on our side of the aisle, we've been very concerned about some of the safety and how the testing goes along. And I'm assuming that that's what you're getting at with this amendment. Can you just kind of go maybe into a little more detail about, uh, I mean, that's a pretty, it's a pretty vague term for law. I'm sure law enforcement knows exactly what that means, but I'm, I'm hoping you can maybe clarify it for the rest of us about what drug evaluation and classification program is or what drug recognition evaluator training is. I, I'm assuming where you're going with this, but could, if you just give a little more detail to it. Yeah, thank you. Senator uh, Port. Sen thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Lang. Um, I can work on finding the page. It, there's a whole section that lays out all of those portions. This is just the paragraph about the appropriation for those programs. Um, that just the only change in this amendment is that it needs to go through the commissioner rather than directly to um, State Patrol, but I can find you um, the sections that deal with laying all those out as well. Senator Lang. All right. Uh, Mr. Chair. Senator Howe. Thank you, uh, Chair Dibble. Uh, Senator Port, my, I guess I'd like to go down that road just a little bit further because I know that there's, there's 197 driver, uh, drug recognition evaluators in the state, and they're dispersed through 92 different agencies. Uh, how many more are we looking to fund in the state patrol? And what are we going to do to entice these folks to take that training? Because I know that these folks are not, get called out at the worst possible times. Uh, that's the reason I got out of being a fire investigator, because... Uh, you go out at the worst possible times and see the worst possible things. So that's my question is, is how many more are we looking to add to the state patrol and what are we gonna do to entice them to actually take the training? Thank you. Senator Port. Thank you, Chair Dibble and Senator Howe. If you give me a moment, we're looking for the page. Mr. Chair. Senator Park. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Howe. Um, we, it is sort of an open question um, because much like the, we don't know how many cannabis licenses will be given out. Uh, we don't know what the rulemaking will be on those. The guidelines right now that are in the bill are that uh, it will be funded to the level that the cannabis uh, management um, Council decides is needed, which they will do in consultation with DPS, um, with the state troopers. Uh, that, that is why we are pulling those folks together into that group, because we didn't want to be the ones to say, this is how many it will take. We want DPS at the table. We want MnDOT at the table. We want the commissioners at the table to make those discussions. Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Port. That's a, that's an excellent question. That's an excellent answer. But the question is, is when? So, when will those neg negotiations and discussions happen in order to actually come up with a number before we pass the bill? 
Um, uh, well, I do know that uh, a fiscal note is in the offing, so we'll, that will yeah. probably provide more more detail. And, and Senator Howe, we will that we is. will bring that discussion back to this committee at some point. I don't know how exactly the mechanism to do that, but because uh, we're not going to drag this bill back in here, but we're going to bring this discussion back in here. Um, but Senator Porter, do you have anything further? I, I will just say we are waiting on the uh, fiscal note, and uh, imagine we will have many discussions at that point. Uh, but but we just we don't know the fiscal number at this point. All right. Thank you. All right. So on the A41, anything further, members? All right. All in favor of the A41, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Motion carries. All right. So uh, we have, uh, why don't we go to um, testimony at this point. And uh, to the public, I, um, I think Senator Port is going to relinquish the table. So we'll have three chairs. And so I will call three people at a time to come forward. Um, and then as someone exits, I will invite the next person up uh, before we go to the next person to testify. So. The first three I have are John Hausladen, Kevin Torgerson, and Glenn McElfresh. No. Yeah. McElfresh. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Hausladen. You said 10 minutes, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Minus eight. Minus eight, okay. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm John Hausladen, president of the Minnesota Trucking Association. Uh, as we've been testifying all along, we oppose the bill. We think fundamentally it will make Minnesota less safe and it will have a negative impact on our workforce. And two minutes isn't enough to dive into all of it. A couple key points as it relates to this committee. We really support the DPS roadside testing for impaired drivers pilot project because the key is impairment, not presence. Right now we have no roadside test to determine uh, impairment and that is the key that we need to drive to. And we still think that this should not be legalized until we have that, but we don't. That needs to be clear in the bill. Secondly, we think that, I'm not sure what the A41 amendment did, but we believe that money was being diverted from the Trunk Highway Fund for this uh, appropriation to DPS. We're essentially taking money for potholes and moving it over to pot recognition. That's a bad trade, it's a bad leak. Uh, also, we think that, as you heard, uh, Director Hansen talked about specificity, clarity, uh, getting data right away is important. We have to beef up accident reporting to track what is really going on here. It's one thing to have it. It's another thing to have the forms with the right fields. It's another thing to have the data and the science to back up to verify that if there's a fatality, what was causing the impairment? We need more money directly for that. Also, specifically to the bill, the courier and uh, transporters should have motor vehicle records mandated. If we're going to put people behind vehicles in commerce, delivering some product, whatever it is, in this case cannabis, they should have to have motor vehicle record checks just like anyone else in commerce because we think that speaks to their safety on the roadways. Uh, we think, as we said all along, the safety data speaks for itself. If you look at Colorado, we've shared that with the committee. Uh, fatalities are up. Uh, we can point that out with some of the data. Hence, we think having a long-term record of what's really happening out there is very important. And I think lastly, last, we have a, last sentence. Uh, we have 8,000 truck driver shortage today. This is only going to make it worse because once someone starts a cannabis lifestyle, they'll never pass a pre-employment drug test. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hausladen. So um, I would invite uh, Ted Gallaty to the, ta to the table, and I will call on Kevin Torgerson next. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I'm Olmsted County Sheriff Kevin Torgerson, representing the Minnesota Sheriff's Association. Most of Senate File 73 indicates effective dates from July and August of 23 or January of 2024. In Article 4, Section 16, this bill authorizes an oral fluid preliminary testing pilot project for public safety between August of 23 until July of 25. We ask you to give public safety the time to complete these projects before and only if you feel compelled to fully legalize marijuana. In Article 1, Section 4, this bill establishes numerous studies and reports to come back to the legislature in January of next year. 
enacting this legislation before public safety has resources to prevent and detect impaired driving by marijuana users, isn't that the cart before the horse? Or maybe buying a new car without safety features? Colorado and Washington have done extensive studies and show that increased deaths directly due to greater marijuana use is real. Article 1, Section 4 in lines 21.30 and 22.4 in this bill draft authorizes the study and development of effects and costs to public safety related to training before drug recognition, for drug recognition experts, DREs, and the forced retirement replacement of current drug detection dogs. For my agency alone, that'll cost me $40,000 at a minum for two canines. Recently, in a letter from the Minnesota Office of Traffic Safety, Director Hansen highlights several concerns the Department of Public Safety has in this matter. Has third, his third issue of five is exactly what we are concerned with related to drug-impaired driver pilot projects being studied. Please listen to your traffic safety experts. Lastly, for nearly 20 years, the number of fatalities on our roads has been reduced nearly in half. When other states legalized marijuana, the number of traffic fatalities has increased where one or more drivers was marijuana impaired. I'm saddened that the increase of loss of life on our roads is considered collateral damage in favor of those who wish to put a foreign substance in their body. We hope those serv that saving lives would be the goal of everyone in this committee and legislature. Thank you, Sheriff. Please work with us. Thank you. All right. So um, I will invite uh, Jeremiah Mosteller to the table. Oh, I'm sorry. Jeremiah Mosteller is remote. Um, so we'll invite Tom Evenstead to the table. Um, however, he'll be after a couple of testifiers before him. But the next person to testify is Glenn McElfresh. All right. Welcome. Thank you. Chair Please Dibble. Introduce yourself and then proceed. Thanks. Yes, sir. Chair Dibble, committee members, and Senator DePorent, thank you for allowing me to speak today on SF73. My name is Glenn McElfresh, and I'm a co founder of Plift, a hemp derived beverage company. I have 10 years of experience in the marijuana industry and significant firsthand experience with the idiosyncrasies of marijuana transportation. From 2018 to 2019, I was the director of expansion at a marijuana distribution company, and my job entailed flying to different states to determine the viability of launching a transportation and distribution business in that state. After the security modifications to the four transit vans, securing and modifying a storage facility to meet any regulatory requirements, and monthly auto insurance premiums that often exceeded the vehicle notes, we never expanded into new markets. From 2019 until December 2022, I managed marijuana operations or submitted applications in states that required the two drivers in every marijuana transport vehicle. This two driver requirement, which is in the current version of FF SF73, raised product prices for patients and consumers and made it even harder for businesses, including social equity businesses, to reach profitability. When my business partner and I made the decision to switch from marijuana-derived products to a hemp-derived product, we were excited to move away from arcane regulatory requirements like the two-driver rule and manufacture trailers full of products to sell across state lines. We are excited to operate under Section 10114 of the Agricultural Improvement Act, the Interstate Commerce Provision, which explicitly states no state or Indian tribe shall prohibit the transportation or shipment of hemp or hemp products produced. The ability to manufacture our products in Minnesota, sell them in other states, and safely transport our products across state lines is critical to our success and ability to create hundreds of good paying jobs for Minnesotans. So I was surprised to see the two driver rule at 65.25 and various restrictions on the transportation and shipment of hemp um, in SF73. I'm particularly concerned that 27.21, 27.28 through 29.11 and the provisions in section 34 or 342.29 directly conflict with the Agricultural Improvement Act of 2018 and the US Constitution's dormant commerce clause. This conflict is highly likely to result in litigation and delay the launch of SF73's automatic expungement provisions, delay the implementation of Minnesota's adult use marijuana program and delay ending the duopoly of Minnesota's two medical marijuana manufacturers. Please do not let SF73 restrict the shipment and transportation of hemp and hemp products. To be perfectly clear, Pliff fully, up, please. Yes, sir. Pliff fully supports legalization, decriminalization, and repairing communities most impacted by the war on drugs. Pliff also supports collaborating with law enforcement agencies across Minnesota and providing them with the tools they need to keep our law enforcement officers, roads, and families safe. Thank you all, 
and I stand ready for any questions. Great, thank you so much. All right, so next we have uh, Mr. Galati or Galati. Galati. Thank you. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, committee chair. Thank you, committee. My name is Ted Galati. I'm the owner operator of Willows Keep Farm and Hemp Maze, Minnesota. We are an agritourism business. We also have Canada Disc Golf Course where you can play golf, disc golf through 13 holes of cannabis field. The issue I have, and we also own the Old Pine Theater. The issue I have as far as the transportation goes is sub section 30, section 38. Both of those are identifying transportation and delivery. I own probably the only hemp hearse in the state and in the country. It's a hearse that I've turned into a hemp hearse. It has logos on it. It says hemp hearse, and it educate and informs the public about the wonderful plant, cannabis. You enact this, and then I don't know if I can even drive that or if I can transport or deliver. Because in this bill, 70, SF 73, 363, 363 times hemp derived or hemp is listed. Only 63 times is marijuana listed in this bill. To me, this bill feels very restrictive as a hemp grower and having a hemp business. We own a store at our farm that's open year round and we also have a location at our Old Pine Theater which is a performing art venue and I will have a location in Hager City. How am I gonna transport? I don't know. The other problem is section 58 with the outdoor advertising. Two signs, that's all it allows. Drive by my, my farmhouse on Highway 52. There's neon signs, there's flags, cannabis flags, there's my logo. I've, I don't know, I'm way over that. I'm probably 10, 15, I don't know, 20 of them. It's an agritourism business. Every single hole should have a cannabis flag, a flag flying with leaves. I'm not gonna be able to do that, I don't know. So I really encourage you all, as this moves through committee, question yourself, is this a hemp bill or is this a cannabis adult use bill, because right now it looks like a hemp bill, and I can't do that. It's gonna really affect my business and perhaps move me out of state. So thank you for your time. If you have any questions, I will be in the room. Thank you, Mr. Galati. All right, so now we're gonna to go to two remote testifiers and then we'll get to you. All right, so next up uh, uh, by Zoom, uh, Jeremiah Mosteller from Americans for Prosperity. Thank you, Chair Dibble and members of the Transportation Committee. I appreciate this opportunity to testify in support of Senate File 73 today. Uh, as Chair Dibble said, my name is Jeremiah Mosteller. I serve as a Senior Policy Analyst at Americans for Prosperity. Legalizing cannabis in Minnesota will allow law enforcement to focus its resources on violent crime and suffocate a black market that is untaxed, unregulated, and unsafe. Every policy choice you make involves trade-offs. So one of the trade-offs that I want to focus on today that other speakers have talked about is cannabis impaired driving. And there are four facts that I would urge you to keep in mind when considering cannabis reform that have been pulled directly from the available research. First, the main psychoactive substance in cannabis, THC, does negatively impact a consumer's ability to drive. But the mere presence of certain levels of THC in someone's system doesn't mean that they are necessarily intoxicated. Second, research does indicate that traffic fatalities and other negative traffic outcomes have slightly increased in states with adult use cannabis markets as we've already heard today. This is not shocking because similar outcomes are seen when states expand alcohol access, but it is still concerning. Third, identifying cannabis intoxication does not have the benefit of decades of research or experience as we do with alcohol consumption. It's right, we do not have a breathalyzer equivalent today just as we did not have one when alcohol prohibition ended. So we need to ensure that law enforcement has the tools they need that are proven to hold up in court to respond to impaired drivers. Lastly, we do have an existing solution and we've heard it today. It is combining robust enforcement of Minnesota's impaired driving laws and the expertise of law enforcement officers trained as drug recognition experts. This 12 step protocol has been proven to be highly effective both in the laboratory and in real world experiment to responding to impaired driving. In some, safety concerns in this area are legitimate. However, there are solutions to help alleviate these issues and equip individuals with the knowledge to consume safely, just as we do with alcohol. These complications should inform how we end cannabis prohibition, but we should not allow fear of the unknown to lock us into failed policies that are not reducing drug use. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to the committee's questions. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mosteller. Next, we have David Benson Stabler, also on Zoom. Hello, David Benson Stabler, lobbyist, uh, registered for SAVE, a C4, and ANC, the Minnesota Anti Narcotic and Anti Addictive Drug Coalition. Uh, speaking to you about three points today very quickly. Um, first of all, is that the, this committee will need to consider the financial ramifications upon its transportation plans, including highway construction and maintenance. It will be harder uh, to ensure those businesses providing those services. Um, operating heavy machinery is something that is difficult to employ in recreational legalized states. This Evidence is clear as day from the associations in Colorado or elsewhere. So those costs will increase. There's less money for roads in addition to other concerns and higher, higher costs. The mass transit plans um, involve um, social planning, having downtown spaces that are supposed to be attractive. What we've seen in Portland, San Francisco, and Denver is the exact opposite um, in places where people feel uncomfortable to go. That's the reality. Um, there's so much uh, evidence of that. And so the whole scheme of mass transit depends on use to pay for it. Uh, the Colorado system is currently in crisis because usage has dropped off so much. Um, there are horror stories about that, which, you know, I, I've, I've seen things in, in Denver. It's horrible. Um, then the third point is that there's still the constitutional infeasibility of the licensure program, which would probably apply as well to uh, certain transportation. Um, Article 13, Section 7 of the Minnesota Constitution forbids licensing lawful grown products. This bill would make all forms of cannabis a lawful product. Okay, if you Therefore, can start to wrap up your uh, testimony, to sir. And uh, so uh, probably certain manufacturer as well, and there could be limits uh, that would be infeasible uh, to number of plants. So this, uh, the Senator Port seems to uh, want to carry on with this bill through committees while we're looking at a situation right. where please, uh, the licensure is, scheme Please wrap up your testimony, Mr. Benson Stabler. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Welcome, Mr. Evenstead. Thank you very kindly. It's a tough act to follow. Um, thank you for allowing me to be here, Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, Senator Port. And um, hello, greetings, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Tom Evenstad, E-V-E-N-S-T-A-D, and I'm here today with Public Safety Minnesota. And initially, I'd like to give a shout out to uh, Governor Jesse Ventura. He manned up after I called him out at the last HF 100 hearing about not being here, and he, he manned up. So I wanna give a shout out to Governor Jesse Ventura. He had powerful testimony that the legacy media didn't cover at all um, about how cannabis saved his life and how it eased the suffering of the First Lady Terry Ventura. Um, so my comments today um, involve transportation. Um, the Cato Institute, which most of you are probably well familiar with, um, a think tank, well-recognized, um, cred credible. According to the Cato Institute, in the states that have legalized recreational cannabis, like we're talking about doing here in Minnesota, there has been no statistically measurable difference in motor vehicle fatalities. Most experts, including myself, believe that there is a effect, cause and effect with alcohol. The more people have access to cannabis and the more they are ingesting cannabis and driving, uh, the safer the roads are because they're drinking less alcohol. Um, and more importantly, in the states that are strictly medical cannabis states that do not have recreational cannabis, um, the data from the Cato Institute is that there is a 10% decrease in motor vehicle fatalities on our highways in the states that are strictly medical. Um, SF-73 does not have the Illinois provision prohibiting law enforcement from using the I smell weed ruse to toss anyone's vehicle they claim to smell weed in. Um, in Illinois, their general, 102nd General Assembly, SB-2-2, 
2939 amends the Illinois Vehicle Code, provides that the odor of burnt or raw cannabis in a motor vehicle by itself shall not constitute probable cause for the search of the motor vehicle. So if there's any real talk about this bill is supposed to do things with racial disparities and help, uh, you know, reparations for people that have suffered, the, 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 the folks that have been impacted the most on this, it's not going to matter unless they include the Illinois provision on the I smell weed ruse that I was victimized even just last July on. I'm happy to, you know, talk after some other time on that. So I wanted to thank the committee right. today and God bless you. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your testimony. All right. That concludes our testimony. Uh, Senator Port, if you could return to the table. All right, so, Senator Port, did you have anything further, or are we ready to move to questions, I discussion, and amendments? I am happy to move to questions and amendments. All right. <laughs> Members, questions, discussion, amendments. Senator Lang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I do have, I appreciate Senator Port uh, uh, taking the time to, to look at some of our amendments that are considered friendly and, and taking a peek at them. So with that, Mr. Uh, chair, I'd offer the A-16. Senator Lang offers the A-16 amendment. And uh, while that's being passed out, Mr. Chair. Oh, maybe it's a different 46. Oh, 46. That's a four. I apologize. <laughs> the A-46 <laughs> amendment. All right. <laughs> so uh, as that comes around, Senator Lang, uh, why don't you... I'll uh, describe it. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. So, uh, members, the, uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, when it comes to the Office of Traffic Safety, the Department of Public Safety designee, the uh, Colonel of State Patrol would assign an uh, additional member to the, uh, the Office of Cannabis Management. And, and that's it in a nutshell, Mr. Chair. All right. So, uh, Senator Port, to response to the A46. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is an, uh, an ongoing conversation we're having about to ensure, how to ensure that our roads are safe. I think this is a great idea. Uh, consider this a friendly amendment. All right. Senator Port recommends an I vote for the A46. Would anyone else like to discuss the A46? All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. <laughs> Members. <laughs> Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to offer the A49. Senator Coleman offers the A49 amendment. And Senator Coleman, to the amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, with previous conversations, I believe this is a friendly amendment that just states um, nothing will be transported outside of the state unless explicitly authorized by federal law, which is pretty much the one sentence in the amendment. All right. Senator Port, response to the A49. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Coleman. Um, we have uh, been thoughtful through this bill to not uh, comment on federal law as much as possible. Um, this, is, this keeps us in line with federal law, and if federal law changes in the future, this would still um, you know, not need to be shifted with it. It would shift with it. So um, I do accept this as a friendly amendment and encourage a yay vote. Senator Port recommends an I vote for the A49. Any further discussion, members? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. Members, Senator Coleman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to offer the A50. Senator Coleman offers the A50, A50, to the amendment while it's being passed out, Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe this is also a friendly amendment that um, wants to put a little more thought behind what might happen to some of the canines involved if the, this bill does pass. Uh, the changes are made in line 1.8 that says the commissioner must allow the handler an opportunity to accept the canine before any other placement options are considered. And then continuing in 110, if the canine's handler does not accept the canine, the commissioner must ensure that the canine is placed in a home where they'll be safe and well cared for. So I'm not sure that did come up for discussion, but it apparently did. And Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Chair Dibble. We've had a couple more discussions uh, oh. since our meeting ended, uh, and this one did come up. Uh, I have no problem with this. Consider it a friendly amendment. The only thing I'll add, Senator Coleman, is I've gotten about six texts from staff around here who would like to be second on the list. <laughs> Third behind me, please. 
Uh, yes, I consider this a friendly amendment. Please, uh, so I encourage a yay vote. If you don't vote yes, you hate dogs. <laughs> All right. Any further discussion? All in favor of the A50 amendment, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Motion carries. Mr. Chair. All right. Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, I'll have, as another friendly amendment, the A48. Senator Howe offers the A48 amendment um, to the amendment while it comes around, Senator In the Howe. A48, Mr. Chair, on line 65.5, it talks about records of transportation must be kept for a minimum of three years. This just adds inspection upon request by the office, uh, the commissioner of transportation, or law enforcement agency. It just adds the commissioner of transportation in those folks that uh, uh, upon request. Is all it does. Great. So Thank I you. appreciate the, uh, the acceptance of the. Thank you. Senator Port to the A48. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Howe. Uh, I consider this a friendly amendment. Encourage a yay vote. Senator Port encourages an aye vote for the A48. All in favor, or oh, any further discussion members? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. All right. Members. Mr. Chair. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Port. Again, I, I appreciate us being able to meet and go over some amendments. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very much against this bill. I will tell you that. I've had that discussion with you. Uh, nothing personal. I uh, just really have some huge concerns over it. Uh, but So we want to try and make it better, and I, I do appreciate your openness to do that. Uh, there's several more things that we're, we'll talk about later, but uh, this is one. Since this is a pretty major change in Minnesota, uh, what this bill is, I'd like to offer the A47 amendment. Senator Jasinski offers the A47 amendment. Senator Jasinski to the amendment as it makes its way around. And thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Port. Again, this basically uh, looks at how things are going. It asks for a report uh, annually to look back and see what, what we've learned on, on with the new things with law enforcement. Uh, I won't go through the whole thing, but basically that's the, that's the gist of it. It looks at a reporting procedures to look at what, how we can learn, what's working, what's not, and any future recommendations on how we can improve uh, if this does get passed. So, Senator Port to the A47. Thank you, Chair Dibble and Senator Dzinski. Um, I also appreciate having the conversation with you. Um, I think this is a great idea. It also will help us in the process of moving from rulemaking as a new agency is set up to deciding if there are things that as a legislature we want to put into statute to require every time. Um, so I think this kind of report will be really helpful in figuring out what is working, um, what we need to come back and take another stab at, uh, what we want to codify into statute. Um, I think this is a great idea and support it and encourage an I vote. Okay. Anything further on the A47 members? All right, Senator Port recommends an aye. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Members. Mr. Chair. Senator Jasinski. I also have another amendment that I talked with uh, Senator Port on as well. Uh, I'd offer the A42 amendment. Senator Jasinski offers the A42 amendment. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Port. Again, this, we, we're talking about legalizing marijuana and uh, existing uh, uses with alcohol. Uh, what this really does is just tr uh, makes uh, the issues with marijuana the same as alcohol as far as packaging, what's allowed in a car while it's being driven, what's not. Uh, I can ask staff to go through it. Actually, it may not be a bad idea to summarize that. Sorry, Ms. Stengel, for putting you on the spot. But I think it talks just briefly go over the, some of the details. Ms. Stengel. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, I admit that this was drafted by your Judiciary Council, but as I understand it, it takes the open container law um, for alcohol and basically makes it apply to cannabis. Senator Port. Thank you, Chair Dibble and Senator Jasinski. Um, I appreciate the conversation that we've had about this. Um, we have been talking about this f it, for the entire time I've been working on this bill. Uh, this was also a recommendation of the DWI task force, um, and this is something we have been continuing to try to find the workable language on. Um, as discussed earlier with you, Senator Jasinski, I am willing to take this today with the caveat that there may be small tweaks that we make along the way as we're ensuring that all of this actually does transfer over um, correctly, but um, this is the path we are moving in. This is the right committee to take it in. So um, I, I will consider this a friendly amendment and encourage an I vote. 
And Senator Porter, if I'm not mistaken, this bill, though it has been in judiciary, it's finding its way back to judiciary. It will be back there, <laughs> yes. All right, so, uh, further discussion on the A42 members. Senator Port recommends an aye vote on the A42. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. All right, members, questions, discussion, amendments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have so Senator many members Jasinski. I'm trying to keep track of them all here. <laughs> we can stop there if you want, Senator Jasinski. <laughs> uh, the next one I'd like to offer, I believe, is the A45 amendment. Senator Jasinski offers the A45 amendment. Senator Jasinski to the amendment. Uh, Mr. Chair, actually, I'd, I'd have council go through this one uh, easier than I can explain it. Uh, Ms. Stengel, if you would be so willing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I won't go through it line by line, but essentially it changes the issuant, who issues the transporter license. So under the bill, it's the Office of Cannabis Management. With this amendment, it moves the issuing of the transporter licenses to the Commissioner of Transportation. Ah, yes, I foreshadowed this conversation. Um, uh, Senator Port. Thank you, Chair Dibble and Senator Jasinski. Um, as we discussed earlier with uh, one of the first amendments that, that I offered, I do think it's critical that uh, the Department of Transportation is in this conversation, which is why we added that as a requirement for the licensing from the Office of Cannabis Management. However, the Cannabis Management Office is going to be issuing mm -hmm through this bill, all the licenses, and they have interplay between each other. Some of them can be issued to some people who have various licenses. Some of them cannot be issued together. Um, it is my belief that they should stay under the Office of Cannabis Management at this point. Um, so I would ask for a no vote on this, but am willing to continue to work as we discussed um, on ensuring that the conversations between uh, the Department of Transportation and the Office of Cannabis Management are secure and that, that they really do have a voice in that. All right, uh, further Chair. discussion on the A45, Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I've had good discussions with Senator Port, so I honestly believe she'll work with me. So with that, I'll, I'll withdraw the A45 amendment. All right, Senator Jasinski withdraws the A45. All right, all right, members. Uh, discussion, amendments, discussion, question, or amendments? Uh, I do Senator have another Jasinski. amendment. It's the A55 amendment. Senator Jasinski offers the A55 amendment. And thank you, Mr. Chair. As we've always talked about, our trunk highway fund has is being depleted, and so what this does is transfers the money uh, from the general fund versus the trunk highway fund. With that, I'll go, uh, actually, council can go through this as well with the dollar amounts and how it's affected. All right, Ms. Boyd. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Dzinski. Yes, this um, makes two changes. It fills in the blanks for the state patrol appropriation sections. Uh, those are subdivisions 15 and subdivision 17, I believe. I don't have the amendment in front of me, but I believe those are in page 245 or 246 of the bill. Um, there are blanks in both those sections. The first one um, also changes the trunk highway fund to the general fund for the source of the funds. It fills in the amounts from the governor's recommendations related to the cannabis bill of seven million roughly in the first year and 3.3, .3, I believe, in the second year. And then in the second um, section would uh, fill in the blanks uh, related to the uh, governor's recommendations we heard earlier related to the pilot project for roadside testing. And that would be 750,000 a year from the general fund. Thank you, Senator Port. Thank you, Chair Dibble and Senator Jasinski. Um, you know, we had part of this conversation earlier today talking about the appropriation that is in the bill right now for some of the money to come out of the trunk highway fund. The reason that that is in there is because in the fiscal note for the last biennium, that was how the agency appropriated the money. They said it, some of it should come out of the trunk highway fund. I am willing to make that change to being instead of the hung tr a trunk highway fund to being from the general fund. Um, where I have a problem with this amendment is that we don't have a fiscal note from this year, and so there are no dollars in this bill at this time, and I am not comfortable putting in fiscal amounts that we do not know are correct. Um, so in this current form, I would ask for a no vote, but would be willing to consider just the changing the trunk highway fund to the general fund piece. 
Senator Jasinski. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Port. Again, I think these came from the governor's recs on what his dollar amounts were. So basically just simply is putting it from the trunk high fund onto the general fund. Um, so I, I'll be willing to work with you, but I would like to take a vote and I'd ask for a roll call, please. All right, so um, I'll just say for my own part, uh, I support, obviously, uh, taking these funds from the general fund. So I am uh, supportive of the uh, spirit and intent uh, of the of the amendments, um, I agree with Senator Port. Uh, you know, uh, drilling down on the on the exact dollar amounts at this point uh, might be a little bit early. And to Senator Howe's point earlier, we are going to revisit this conversation here in this committee um, at some point. Um, so, with that, anything further, members? All right. So, a roll call has been requested. A roll call granted. And. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Dibble? No. Vice Chair Morrison? No. Senator Jasinski? Aye. Senator Carlson? No. Senator Coleman? Aye. Senator Herr? No. Senator Howe? Aye. Senator Lang? Aye. Senator McEwen? No. Senator Port? No. So with four voting yes and six voting no, uh, the A55 is not adopted. <laughs> Members. Uh, further questions, uh, discussion, or amendments? Senator Lang. Hey, Mr. Chair, sorry, you, you voted so fast on that last one. I think I could fix this. Uh, I'd like to make an oral amendment if I could, and hopefully Senator Port would be a, amendable to that, where we use the same language from what Senator Jasinski said, except just uh, I think it takes his A55 amendment, shrinks it down, so that on line 1.5 to line 1.6, it starts at uh, the trunk highway and insert general and just leave it at that. And I'd ask Ms. Stingle to say that what I said was correct. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chair? Senator, uh, Ms. Stingle. <laughs> Mr. Chair and Senator Lang, you are correct, but I'm gonna put a little polish on it. Um, so the amendment would be page 245, line 32, delete trunk highway and insert general. All right, so that's an oral amendment. Um, uh, Senator Port. Thank you, Chair Dibble and Senator Lang. I do consider that a friendly amendment and uh, encourage an I vote. All right, so to the Lang oral amendment, further discussion members. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. All right, uh, Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to offer the A56. Senator Coleman offers the A56 amendment. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So back to the dogs. Um, <laughs> uh, what this amendment does, and it's really just one important sentence, it um, specifies that 258,000, and that number came from last year's bill's fiscal note, um, uh, goes to from the general fund to the commissioner of public safety for the state patrol for the retirement and replacement of canines. Uh, just to make sure that this doesn't get lost in the process, it also goes towards the canine and trooper training costs as well. Um, that's it. That's the one big sentence, the other one being about the, the date. All right. Senator uh, Port. Thank you, Chair Dibble and Senator Coleman. I'm wondering if you would consider an oral amendment to your amendment um, that would remove the 258,000 and make it the dot, dot, dot that we put in for no, no money. But I've been very clear that we are not going to put money in until we get the fiscal amount. I'm willing to take the language with the caveat that we will add it in uh, when I get the fiscal note. Um, but would, would offer that oral amendment. Senator Coleman. Uh, with your, your word that these dogs will be taken care of in the final version, I would accept that. Thank you. Thank All right. You. So um, question to council. Um, can we just, um, how do we effectuate the change to the 
A56. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think you have two options. Uh, the author of the amendment could incorporate that change into her amendment, or you could vote on both pieces, whichever you prefer. Right. Um, and if it's helpful, the change would be on line 1.4, delete 258,000, and insert a blank. All right. Senator Coleman, are you so willing? Yes, whichever route the chair would right. prefer. All right. So Senator Coleman would offer the A56 um, with the change to the printed version, inserting a blank where 258,000 appears on line four. Anything further, members? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no, motion carries. All right, members, questions, discussion or amendments? Senator Lang. Mr. Chair, um, this may be a friendly, and we'll see. Um, no, really. Uh, I, uh, the Minnesota State Patrol has a, a long history of uh, uh, increasing patrols and enforcement on, on special holidays, some of which are recognized by the state, some of which are not. Uh, and th this particular bill has a date that is in my mind. Oh. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to offer the A52. What that does is on April 20th, it uh, increases state patrol. Uh, this, would, <laughs> this would be uh, so, sort of a, a funny amendment, but I, I think at the end of the day, it actually uh, shows a little bit of integrity from us saying that, hey, uh, we recognize this day as uh, recognizable and that we uh, care about safety, and, and, and that's where I'm going with that, Mr. Chair. It's too bad this is not the, four, the A420 amendment. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, Senator... Um, to Thank the you. A52 Thank you, Chair Dibble uh, and Senator Lang. You really missed an opportunity there. Um, I am wondering if, I, I know we have someone from DPS here, if they could come up. I, I honestly don't know how they do this, if these are usually in statute, if this is rulemaking, if this is something they're, like, I don't know how this works for them, so I'm wondering if they could come up and speak to it. And someone magically appears, Mr. Hansen. <laughs> Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thanks. Mr. Chair and members, again, my name is Mike Hansen. I serve as the, the director for the DPS Office of Traffic Safety. The enhanced enforcement events uh, that the senator was referring to do take place uh, in unknown periods of time over the course of the year when there's a tendency for impaired driving offenses to increase. And that's supported uh, primarily through federal overtime funding that we provide to over 300 agencies across the state, including the Minnesota State Patrol. Uh, certainly adding another date to that calendar uh, is something that we certainly could consider. Would it be acceptable in statute, or would you do it during rulemaking? I think rulemaking is probably the easiest way to go with this, but I, from the DPS standpoint, I think either approach, whatever the, the committee would decide or the author would decide, um, would be acceptable for us. All right. Senator Park. Thank you, uh, Chair Dibble and Senator Lang. Um, I'm, I'm going to take a leap here and say that um, we can adopt this with the caveat that we will continue to talk with the agency and make sure that that works for them um, and we're not putting something in statute that makes it more difficult for them to, to get their folks out. Great. Thank you. Anything further on the A52-420 amendment? <laughs> all right. Never get tired of that joke. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. Mr. Chair. Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, I know that the bill has the oral fluid preliminary testing pilot project authorized. Uh, what I would offer is I would offer the A43 amendment that actually details that out a little further. It comes back to really uh, some a, a bill that was offered last year. And it just details it out and just says that the Commissioner of Public Safety will do it instead of can do it. And so it's a little bit, uh, and details it out a little bit more, says that uh, they're gonna conduct it between September 1 and of 23 and August of, of uh, 24, and then have a report back to the legislature by February 1 of 2025 to see if we need to do anything with it or how it goes. So it just, it's, 
very similar, but instead of is, instead of uh, is authorized to, this basically says they they sh they're going to do it and uh, kind of lays out a little bit more detail about when it's going to happen. Otherwise, it's very similar. So Senator Howe offers the A43. Um, members, did you want any further explanation from Council? Senator Park. Thank you, Chair Dibble. I'm wondering if Council can go through the changes. I'm, I'm looking through them as quickly as I can now, but if, if Council has specific advice on what the changes are between the two languages. Ms. Stengel. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Another one I will have to confess that was written by the Judiciary Council. I'm trying to phone a friend. Uh, if you can just give me a minute, I'll see if I can get a better explanation. Sure. You know, it, Senator Howe. It, thank you, Mr. Chair. And you know, it it also doesn't allow uh, this to be used either in in the proceedings. So they can't. It's it's basically trying to figure out if this uh, the instruments work or they don't work in in the process. But if you want to you want to hold this off, and I can go to another amendment. And we sure. Can Why don't we do that? Uh, so, uh, Senator Howe. Withdraws the A43 and Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and so uh, the other concerns we have is, is driving under impairment. And when we don't have the, the pro pilot project done and we don't know what actually how that we can test for this, uh, I would like to see us, because DUI to me is a, is a very crucial element to this piece. So I would offer the A39, which basically says if you've got any amount of cannabis or uh, THC or the met metabolites, it basically says you're under the influence. So, so Senator Howe moves the A39, A39 amendment. Um, Senator Part, when you're ready. Thank you, Chair Dibble and Senator Howe. Um, members, I'll ask for a no vote on this. Uh, part of uh, the struggle that, that uh, exists with cannabis testing for impairment is that it stays in your body long after you are no longer impaired. Um, can be up to 30 days uh, or longer after. Um, and so this would have no correlation to whether or not you're actually impaired while, uh, when you are tested. Um, there are significant, uh, I, I guess I'll go back and say, the only substance that we have an oral test for that where impairment is equal to or able to be measured by a blood alcohol level or by an oral test is alcohol. It is an outlier. There are lots of other things you can take while driving uh, to impair you, Ambien, uh, hemp, THC, um, cannabis, uh, sleeping pills, cold medicine, opioids. Um, there are many, many things you can take to be impaired. It is illegal to drive while impaired. Uh, we have a test for alcohol, a, a breathalyzer test, and a blood alcohol test. For those other things, we have roadside sobriety tests that are able to test a person's impairment. Um, that will still be the case. We are putting significant money in this bill to developing an oral test. We want to find um, that technology. It does not yet exist. And, um, that technology, it does not yet exist. And um, I, this amendment doesn't get us there. So I ask for a no vote. Thank you. Thank Anything you, further? Chair. Senator Howe. Uh, you know, and I, and I acknowledge that fact. And I think that uh, what drives this is, is uh, when you had the sheriff up here talking about, we don't know. And we, we, and in order for us to keep our roads safe, uh, I think this would be 
the step in the right direction of, you know what, we don't have any tolerance for this until we get a test that works. But uh, that's, that's my position, and I'm, I take that from law enforcement, and that's, that's where I'm at. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll, I'll ask for a roll call. All right. Uh, so uh, Senator Howe requests a roll call vote on the A39. Anything further, members? Senator Lang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess this spurred on a little bit of thought. Um, so we have an intoxicating substance that we're going to legalize that you can drive with after it's legalized, but we don't have a way to test it. And there's been a little conflicting testimony today on whether or not uh, it's going to be more dangerous on the roadways. I'm curious if a state patrol pulls someone over, one, um, and they say they're impaired and they go and take a blood test afterwards, what's the limit? I mean, how, how do we, as a state, say, yes, they're impaired and we trust the trooper, or they're not impaired and we trust the blood test. At what level are we talking? Welcome. Please introduce yourself for the record and respond. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Laylee Fadahi. I am the campaign manager for MN is Ready. We are the state's largest and most diverse coalition of cannabis policy stakeholders. Uh, and we have been working to ensure that this bill uh, and the provisions in it work for all the different stakeholders in Minnesota. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Lang, this is, again, as Senator Port has said, not a particularly unique issue, and that includes even in the context of alcohol, where we do have breathalyzers and we do have blood tests, but those in and of themselves are not sufficient to secure a criminal conviction. You actually need to, you know, typically have the roadside impairment test and that evaluation as conducted by the police officer. Um, and then, you know, the, the additional testing would uh, be ancillary to that. So, you know, this is, this is comparable, as Senator Port said, to other instances where you might have someone driving impaired under any number of circumstances where there is not a a body fluid test of some sort available, um, and yes, the officer uh, typically provides testimony to that effect, and that is what is used in a court. Great, thanks, Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and Senator Lang. I would just point you in the amend in the amendment uh, that Senator Howe offered to lines 1.11 and 1.12. This is a statute we already have. Um, Oh, maybe that's not his. This is the, oh, yours, A39. Is that what we're on? Yeah. Um, 1.11 and 1.12. Like, this is already in statute. You cannot drive impaired on a substance that you know or have reason to know is impairing. Um, it's already illegal. So if, if you are pulled over and a sobriety, a roadside sobriety test is done, right now you could be arrested for that, regardless of whether it was Ambien you took or opioids, um, you know, whether or not there's a blood test for it. So, Mr. Senator Lang. So, Senator Port, to answer my question, uh, if you do use Ambien or opioids or marijuana or whatever it may be, and the officer says you're impaired, that holds up in court, regardless of what the testing level is? Senator Port. That's my understanding, yes, Senator Lang. Two for two? Is that what you, would you agree? Oh, Ms. Fatahi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Lang, it would be, yes, the same as any other situation where you have an officer um, saying that the person was impaired. Does it hold up in court? I mean, if your specific question is, does in every instance that is in and of itself enough. No, there are, uh, you know, like rules of, you know, criminal procedure so, and things like that. But yes, that is a standard form of testimony and evidence, the primary form of testimony and evidence that goes towards whether somebody is impaired or not. If I may, um, you know, I'll just call your attention to the, to the sentence that is repeated um, throughout the amendment. 
a person's body contains any amount of marijuana, tetrahydrocannabidiols, or their metabolites. Any amount. With no relation to impairment. So, Mr. Chair, that's because we don't Senator know. Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. But we have no idea where that level is that's going to impair someone. We so, have but, that in statute for alcohol, but... But Nowhere I'll, else do we have that. And if you, you know, I wouldn't mind having the sheriff come up and talk to us about his, uh, his, uh, how that works as far as testing folks and roadside sobriety tests and impairment tests, if we could do that. Sheriff. Sorry, I was in conversation. All right. Saw. The question is, uh, how does a roadside sobriety test? When it comes to uh, impaired drugs, alcohol, it's a little bit different, obviously, because right. we have the, the PBT, the portable breath test. Breath test. So just please and state your name for the, for I'm the sorry, record. Sheriff Thank Kevin Torgerson, Olmsley County Sheriff's Office. Right. Um, in these situations where it's an impaired and there's not alcohol odor present or evidence that there's alcohol, the officer, regardless of agency, <clears throat> has to go through the, the same SFSTs, so standard field sobriety tests. So there's physical impairment, physical observations that the officer makes. That's just the preliminary, preliminary portion of it. If they feel the person is impaired at, based on failure of those uh, field sobriety tests, then they have to take them to prove it to either submit them to a blood or a urine test. Um, and then that goes to the BCA and comes back. And then it still only says presence. It doesn't give us the amounts like we are familiar with, with 0 0.08 or 0 0.10 or whatever. So there's still our additional steps. But it has to be first proven by the um, failure of, of field sobriety test and then documented by the officer in a report. Thank you. Senator Lang. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Sheriff, as long as I got you up here. So I, I think we're in kind of a strange place here where alcohol is very easily defined on what the limit is. Correct. But if you do have Ambien in your system or, or, well, I suppose opioids would probably be something different where that's illegal. Uh, I guess the question is when you pull someone over, you uh, conduct a field sobriety test, you get them to court, you get them in front of a judge, and you said this person was impaired, Your Honor. What, at what point can they say, um, with alcohol was a .08, then you make that argument at that point on what's, you know, what side of the line you are, but how do you do that with opioids well, or Ambien or any other right. of the substances Chair. we've been talking about? Mr. Chair and Senator Lang, um, there's one other piece that I, I omitted initially, and that is the DRE, which you've all been talking here about again today. The drug recognition expert is an additional step in proving that limit. And uh, the drug recognition experts are that. They are experts. They've had extensive training. And the challenge that we've been talking about over all these committees is there's not enough of them, not only in the state patrol, but across the state. Most agencies don't have them, don't have the money to train them. Um, so that's another additional step to proving the, the impairment level is having a DRE that's able to go to court in lieu of a test of saying that this person is, is impaired at the point that they were given the test or given the, 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 the DRE examination. So I don't know if I'm answering that, your question fully, but... Um, it seems, seems like I'm missing something else you were asking, Senator. No, I, th I, think, uh, I think you okay. got the gist of it, at least for my purposes. Uh, right. You know, the, the, the question in front of us is, in the case of someone having ingested something that causes impairment for which there is not, uh, you know, a, 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 a biological test that can establish, right. you know, the level of impairment similar to blood alcohol uh, content, um, and it sounds like the field sobriety test in tandem with the proof that the substance is present in tandem with the drug recognition expert is the evidence that would stand up in court, which would be the same case in the instance of use of marijuana, given that, you know, marijuana is present, someone fails a field sobriety test and a DRE, 
um, can also uh, attest to their level of impairment, then a case could be made that they were driving while impaired. Mr. Chair, there is sure. one, more, one more piece that if someone is alleging or saying that I've had the Ambien or whatever other uh, prescribed drugs or whatever, um, the DRE can indicate that impairment again, but they can't pinpoint what that is as far as what that impairment is. So then the only other option left is to do that blood or urine test that the BCA has to run and then it comes back and again, then it will identify or it can identify components of what the drug is that's in that individual system. Uh, and hopefully that's clear enough for the courts to accept and understand that this is impairment by prescribed drugs. It's still impairment and still a hazard on our roads, um, but at least they can help identify that. But that takes, it's quite a process as you can understand. All right, Mr. Chair. Senator Jasinski. Just to and thank you, Sheriff, for being here. I really appreciate it. So, again, so there's a there's a lot of gray area here. I'm, I'm, my, my point is there's a lot of gray area here. So, again, alcohol, you, you know, you get the cards, you can drink, you know, three beers in two hours, depending on your weight. You get all these charts. So, for this, if this gets approved, there's nothing even close to saying, are you half stoned or fully stoned or, uh, you know, so my, my, that's my concern, number one. And then going back to the other one on the presence of it in your system, so with the recent farm bill, a lot of people are taking the uh, edibles to help sleep. And I've, I've talked to many people that this really helps them do that. So if they're taking a half of a gummy, which is five milliliters or milligrams or whatever it is, and they take a half of one every night to sleep and they get pulled over uh, and maybe they're, uh, I guess, I don't know if they can do it if they uh, have a CDL or not, if they're a truck driver, but if they you know, have that, if it gets tested in their system and, and there is a presence of it from the, from the nightly pill and they're just having a bad day and they're tired and it comes up that they're under the influence, they don't know, isn't there a lot of gray area to, to go into court? Because usually when you go into court, you have all the documents, your levels, all those things. I just think it's opening ourselves up to a wide open array of, of issues in court of were you half high, half stoned, fully stoned? Uh, was it something else? Uh, was it, and maybe in, in, or maybe in also with alcohol, both having both in their system, I mean, how, how do you ever do this on a roadside test to decide, you know, what's going on? It just seems very, very cumbersome to, to me as you being a law enforcement of all these decisions that I make. And then you add that onto our lakes and our, our water patrol and our DNR officers on snowmobiles. I mean, there are so many things going on and so many decisions. And you already said there was the, the lack of people being trained in the, I can't remember the, the adjective you used for it, but... I mean, this just opens up a whole can of worms for law enforcement, for our court system of, of how we're dealing with this. And to do this prematurely before we have some of those ideas on how that works, this is way, and, and I told Senator Port, I'm way against this for many, many reasons. This is one of them. There's just so many unknowns here that we don't know how it affects people, uh, how it affects in with relation to other drugs, uh, with alcohol, uh, the consistency of what they're getting uh, in in the substance. Uh, can you address just some of them? I mean, the day-to-day, -day, how you deal with all those different variations and, and what you're gonna have to deal with. Because you're gonna do it. It's gonna be your department and it's gonna be out there trying to enforce this. And given what's there, how the heck do you d patrol this? Yeah. I, uh, so, Sheriff. Uh, thank you, sorry. Succinct Mr. response Chair. for, you know, time. Yeah, I'll try, I try, but with people that know me, that's very Senator difficult. Senator Jasinski made most of your point. Right? He did, and he did, and it is very difficult. It's very gray. My, my office, Southeast Minnesota, Rochester, we're fortunate with our office and Rochester PD and the State Patrol to have some DREs that are readily available. We can share that. Most of our small counties, small cities, they don't have that option with the DRE. So it does make it extremely difficult. And it's very possible that people are gonna be charged that are, you know, as we say, as you were saying, slightly impaired or whatever. Uh, you've all seen the commercials, the buzz driving. Um, it's really messy. I don't know how else to say it. It's not very scientific, but it's very messy and very difficult. And it's gonna be very difficult for our deputies and officers and troopers. All right, thank you. I just one follow up. Uh, Senator Jasinski. So with this bill, if this bill gets approved, do you believe it's gonna improve traffic safety on our roads? No, not, not at all. So, thank uh, you. Sheriff, please wait till I call on you Sorry. to respond. Um, all right, anything further members on the A39? Senator Coleman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I don't know who can answer this question, but I'm just noodling over this. 
So my question is if this amendment isn't accepted upon enactment of this bill, if my little boys get on a school bus, that bus driver can have marijuana in his system or does this not impact that? Senator Pork. Thank you, Chair Dibble and uh, Senator Coleman, no. Uh, there is already provisions in the bill that don't allow for people who have safety components to their jobs, uh, like school bus drivers, um, things like that, uh, to consume cannabis uh, while they are working or in the time before they are working. There are many provisions in the bus or in the bill to, to ensure that those sort of safety positions um, are still allowed to be, uh, have, have restrictions on those people being able to consume cannabis. Um, what I will also say uh, in addition uh, with this amendment is this is already happening. This is already happening on our roads. Uh, you can tell because there are hundreds of thousands of people who have gone to jail in Minnesota for possessing, smoking, and driving while under the influence of cannabis. This is already a thing that our law enforcement is dealing with. It's not perfect, but it is. it has a tremendous cost to our communities already. And there is significant research um, from all of the states which have legalized that does not paint a clear picture that this is a, a terrible road hazard. Um, there are many uh, findings from 65 different studies on cannabis legalization and roadway safety published in December 22, 2022 issue of the American Journal of Prevention, Preventative Medicine found major risks of bias in almost all of the studies. Uh, especially those most often cited as showing that legalization results in higher incidence of traffic accidents and fatalities. The biggest thing that the studies across all of the states have found is that states that invested in education efforts to let people know that it is unsafe to drive while consuming cannabis were the states that had the least effect. So we know we can do something. And we put money for it in the bill. We can educate people that driving while impaired under cannabis is dangerous. And that is a thing we are taking seriously. We also think it's important to actually fund the drug recognition experts that are needed across the state. We have 262 something of them currently. We do need more. And we need to pay them well enough that we can hire more. I am. Can, committed to continuing to work on this. I agree with all of you that this is a part of the concern that we have to answer with this bill. This amendment is not that answer. This amendment would mean it would be illegal for you to drive if you take a half a gummy at night to sleep because you would always have some in your system. You could never drive. If you take a full spectrum CBD, if you are on medical marijuana, like it, there are, it would complete, this amendment does not work. Um, with that, Chair Dibble, I, I again ask for a no vote on the amendment. Mr. Mr. Chair, Chair, follow up if I could. Oh, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Port, for the explanation. I just want to clarify on your, your response. So is it school bus drivers can have none in their system or there's restrictions on the amount of time before operating a school bus? Senator Port. Uh, Ms. Fatahi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Coleman, the bill uh, provides um, that if somebody is employed in a safety sensitive position, would inc which includes anybody that is, uh, has you know, a commercial driver's license, anybody um, that is uh, in a position where they are providing care for. Uh, children or anybody in a you know, vulnerable population like that, that it can remain a condition of their employment that they test negative um, for cannabis use. So um, that would remain an allowable thing that school bus drivers have to take drug tests and they have to test negative in order to be school bus drivers. Senator Coleman. I want to follow up, and thank you, Mr. Chair. I know this is going a little bit down a school bus rabbit hole. So that would be permissible under the school bus company. That would not be a policy of the state that school bus drivers cannot have any marijuana in their system. 
Senator Park. Thank you, Chair Dibble and, and Senator Colbeck. That's correct. It would allow them to still have that provision. I believe it is a provision right now um, in, as far as I know, every uh, school bus uh, company, but that, that would be allowed to continue to be um, a position or, or uh, an allowable test. Thank you. Mr. Chair. I would, I, what I, I would like to drop the uh, roll call on this amendment, but I would also like to say that I'm looking at a report that says Colorado traffic deaths up 75 per year since cannabis was legalized. Right. Thank you. Senator Jasinski. Mr. Chair, and a follow-up, I'll, I'll go off the school bus drivers, but uh, so Valley Fair, we have an amusement park here, so uh, the, the workers that put our kids on those rides... So you're telling me they can have zero tolerance in their bloodstream uh, for marijuana. Is that correct? Senator Port. Thank you, Chair Dibble and Senator Jasinski. I'm not sure that I would count the people who uh, run rides at the fair as being responsible for the care, training, and education of children. Um, well, though, though I would say that that's a safety sensitive position, so um, I'd be happy to look into that specifically, but theoretically, yes. Senator Dzinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Port. Again, yeah, so these people strap our kids in, they latch the buttons, they do all the things, they run the controls. Uh, so I would think from a safety standpoint, they would fall under that category because that opens up to a whole host of several other things. I mean, we have county fairs, we have valley fair, we have all kinds of things going on. And if you have that, which I, I think they should, I mean, we have a workforce issue already and the people that won't be qualifying to do any of these things, um, I, I think it's going to be difficult uh, for a lot of workforce issues uh, when you see things like this because if I was a parent and I sent my kid to Valley Fair, I would hope to God that people, you know, putting my child uh, in that ride and latching that latch are not under the influence. If I may, Mr. Senator Park. Uh, looking up the statute that's referenced in, in the section, uh, 181.950 subdivision 13, yes, that they would be allowable to still uh, be required to be tested. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, on the A39, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. 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 The motion does not prevail. The A39 is not adopted. All right, members. Uh, Senator Howe. Mr. Chair, I'd like to go back to the A43 amendment, if we may. Senator Howe. Uh, okay, that's right. Uh, going back to the A43, that's right. We had uh, suspended that. So, uh, Senator Howe offers the A43 amendment. And Senator, or Ms. Stingall, you're going to provide a quick description of the A43. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you for your patience on this. So, in the underlying bill, there is an oral fluid preliminary testing pilot project. This amendment deletes that pilot project and inserts this new pilot project, which requires the Commissioner of Public Safety to basically look um, at the various oral fluid roadside testing instruments to look at whether they're practical, whether they're accurate, and all those sorts of things. Um, the, the project runs um, for, through September this year through the end of August in 2024. It can't be used for um, deciding to arrest people. It's not admissible in any legal proceedings. Um, so basically, um, sort of running this as a parallel just to see how, how the equipment is working. And then um, in early 2025, the commissioner has to report back to the legislature on the results of the pilot project. All right. Senator Port. Thank you, Chair Dibble and Senator Howe. Um, just two things I'd like to say. Uh, Jordan from uh, DPS is here. I'd like to hear if we actually, like if this is achievable on their timeline. Um, I'm, I'm happy to move it if it is. Uh, I don't have a particular problem with the language other than, and I'm still new here, um, I thought we weren't supposed to say shall, and this says shall like six times. Ah, yes. <laughs> Good eye. Uh, Mr. Hansen. Good evening again, Mr. Chair and members. Again, my name is Mike Hansen. I serve as the director for the DPS Office of Traffic Safety. Um, and in regards to the, the, uh, the timelines and so forth, yes, I don't think we would have any problem with that. Okay. All right. Um, uh, Council, should we um, change all the shells to musts? 
Uh, Mr. Chair, that is up to you All right. and the members. So, If you would like to do that, you can right. instruct me to make that change. Right. Uh, if as Senator Howe is agreeable. Yeah, I will accept that as a All right. friendly amendment. It's just that, you know what, in, in the code language, it's just the opposite. So oh, that's what I'm used to. So uh, the A43 uh, is reoffered by um, Senator Howe. Senator Port recommends a yes vote. Accept that all the shalls shall read as must. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. All right. Uh, I was, was going to try to get Mr. Hansen to stay. Oh, Mr. Hansen, I think. Uh, <laughs> I think they want you to I got stay one at the more, table. I got one more amendment. You want to ask? Go, go with your amendment. Yeah. All right. Um, just hang out there for a moment, and we'll go with Senator Howe's next amendment. Uh, basically, what this does is it, it, it establishes an effective date for, for everything, and this is the A53 amendment. What the so A53 does... Senator Howe offers the A53. Yeah, the, this bill is effective on the later of July 1, 2023, or upon the colonel of the state patrol certifying the commissioner of public safety that every state trooper employed by the state patrol on the effective date of this act has been trained on the provisions of this act and how to properly enforce them. If another effective date is specified elsewhere in the bill, the effective date is the later of the specified date or the certification date required by this section. So the right guy is at the table to answer that, so. To the A53, Senator Port. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm not sure there was a question in there for um Mr. Hansen, but uh, I would ask for a no vote on this amendment. All right. Senator Howe. Mr. Chair, I'm just looking that uh, I believe that if we're going to maintain the safety of our roadways, uh, our state troopers should be, should be trained up on the implementation of the bill. And uh, to do it before that, uh, really puts our road network in jeopardy as we have officers out there without really the tools to actually enforce what's out there. And I think it'll, it'll, it'll cause confusion and uh, it'll make our roadways even worse than they currently are. All right, thank you. Anything further on the A53? All in favor, oh, Senator Lang. Sorry, Mr. Chair, apologize before, before we go to the vote, I was just, and I got Mr. Hansen at the table. Um, uh, members, I think we've been pretty good about staying on task. We haven't really talked about marijuana a whole lot. We've been talking about testing mechanisms and tossing, talking a lot about safety in the committee that we should be talking about safety. We have a safety expert sitting at the table with us. Uh, I've been busy Googling away on my uh, little black computer up here looking at Colorado. And they legalized marijuana in 2013 since that time frame. Uh, there's been pretty su substantial statistical evidence showing that roadway deaths have been up. Now they've gone anywhere between from what I've been looking at, I'm sure there's statistical anomalies within what those uh, reporting mechanisms are, but the lowest I could find was 138%, the highest I could find was 157. Now there was some alcohol that was involved with those as well. Um, so I guess my question to Mr. Hansen and, and uh, th this is st strictly safety speaking now, uh, how many roadway deaths? Can you remind us again? What was it last year? I know that it was kind of up and down, and you mentioned that earlier in the committee hearing, but... Director Hansen. Uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Lang, uh, last year preliminary numbers are 442 in, on Minnesota roads. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Hansen. 138% increase on the low end to that, uh, hopefully not in immediately. Um, I see a gray area here between when we have the technological <laughs> capability and I, I've been seeing saliva tests and seeing a bunch of other breath tests and blood tests that go along with that. Um, I'm very concerned about the fact that we're accepting 138%, maybe more increase in roadway deaths as we go forward. Um, there was a couple of testifiers up before that said it was either safer or not safer. Could you maybe just speak to that a little bit? Um, Specifically speaking, just to the, the public safety aspect to it. And Director Hansen. Mr. Chair, Senator Lang, um, I'm not sure where the other testifiers 
came up with some of that information, but talking with my counterparts across the country, um, there is an impact to what happens on our roads. And uh, Colorado and Washington, based on some of their studies, have shown an increase in the number of fatalities. Uh, again, some of that is attributed to cannabis or polydrug use between cannabis and alcohol or other things. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's hard to predict what, what Minnesota might look like, uh, but we have to look at historically what has happened in other uh, areas where it has been legalized. Senator. Lang. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Hanson. I think you, uh, before we vote on this amendment, I, th I think it's important to note that regardless of how you feel about cannabis, this is a public safety issue, to say the least. I think it's probably going in the wrong direction when it comes to this, not having that testing mechanism on the far end. Um, I think we're making a mistake by trying to pass this out of committee today before we have all the information in front of us, especially when it comes to testing, especially when it comes to what does law enforcement look like on this. And I, I truthfully, after sitting in this room for three and a half hours, don't know. Um, I'm concerned for the citizens of the state. I'm concerned for our public safety sector. I'm sure concerned for the, the guys in the uniform in the back of the room that don't know how they're going to try to implement not only the legalization of, of marijuana, but the <laughs> the law enforcement aspect to it, the, the regulation, we just don't know. So, um, I don't know, we're in a weird place. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right, on the A53, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. 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 Uh, motion does not carry, the A53 is not adopted. All right, members, anything further on Senate File 73? Uh, Mr. Chair, could, Mis could Mr. Hansen come back to the oh, table? Sorry, Mr. <laughs> Not so fast. Hopefully, he's uh, he's got this answer. But I was just I was just wondering, do you, the DREs the uh, how long does it take to actually train an officer in DRE? Mr. Hansen, Mr. Chair and Senator, how uh, very good question. Um, it's an extensive process. Um, and if you talk to any of the officers that have gone through the DRE training, it's probably the most rigorous academic exercise that a street officer can participate in. Not everybody can do it. Um, the, the training consists of about 10 days in the classroom, and then there is another period of time where the officers uh, travel out of state to do their certifications. So they'll go to California or Arizona or Philadelphia or Florida, uh, where they actually conduct their evaluations on uh, subjects who are under the influence of the various categories of the drugs. And so uh, the, the, the training period uh, can, you know, run up to a couple, three months, depending on scheduling and how quickly we can get into some of those outstate facilities. Mr. Chair, follow-up. Senator Help. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so uh, I know that there's 197 DREs in Minnesota. How many of those are state troopers? Uh, Director Hansen. Mr. Chair and Senator, how, um, uh, the, I think I'm going to correct the number. I believe our, our total number is 262 statewide, um, and about 30% of those are state troopers. Um, that's a rough number, so don't quote me on it, but it's, it's right in that ballpark. All right. Well, Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm surprised because I got it from the state patrol that if there was 197 in the state throughout 92 uh, agencies, but I'll... That's neither here nor there, but I, I guess 30% uh, of those are the state troopers. And what, how is it, is it easy to get folks to volunteer to take that training, or is that a problem to get those folks to actually volunteer to, or do you just assign the folks to suck it up and take it? Because coming from the fire side of the house, being a fire investigator, I knew what it was like getting called out at every hour of the night to come and go to the worst incidents that you didn't want to see, and I'm sure the DREs are in the same boat. So is that something they readily volunteer for? Is that something you got to entice them to do? Director Hanson. Mr. Chair, Senator Howe, I, I would probably defer that question to the sheriff. Uh, what I can tell you or what I can share with you anecdotally, as I said, not, not every officer can do this because it is very, very challenging. Officers that are motivated uh, and are committed to removing impaired drivers, they will readily sign up for this training and they will use it. Um, but again, it's not something every agency can afford and it's not every officer that can, can, that can uh, succeed in this particular area of expertise. All right. 
Members, anything further on Senate File 73? Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So we're opening up for comments now? Yes. Okay. So again, I, I've voiced my concern over this bill. Uh, I think it's, it's going to be just terrible for our state of Minnesota uh, to approve this bill. Um, it, it's frustrating to watch the, the emphasis that, that has been put on this, uh, what's going to go on, what will happen to our state. There's, I mean, I have so many questions, and I'll try and make them brief. And, and you know, does this improve safe, public safety on our roads and highways? And, and I think there's no way. And we, we, we fight for zero deaths, the zero total zero deaths campaign. We try and reduce the number of deaths on our roads, and this is going to turn the opposite. It's not going to help. Uh, so that's my number one concern is, is that. Uh, the testing, we don't have testing in place to do any of this, and it's going to be so many issues, as the sheriff said, as far as testing, roadside, training our DREs, all those things, what's going on. Uh, I, I think the testing is a huge issue. Uh, we don't have the testing for it. Um, the fiscal note, we have no fiscal note, what this is going to cost. Uh, listening to some of the costs that we're hearing about uh, from the DRE, training DREs, uh, to losing our dogs. I, w I was the mayor of Faribault and actually did a fundraising campaign to raise money to get a police dog, to have a drug dog, and now that money is going to go away because these dogs can't be used anymore, given that. Um, so there's a huge cost there, uh, you know, economic and our social costs, uh, our kids. This is going to be more acceptable to kids now. So kids, I just heard of an incident at a school the other day where one of the kids brought gummies to school not knowing they were marijuana gummies, and the whole classroom of kids got stoned. And they had to call the ambulance, they had to call the police, they didn't know what to do. Uh, and this is just opening it up for our kids. Um, you know, the police dog discussion of all that and retraining, what's going to cost our local law enforcement agencies who've done these dogs, who've, who've spent thousands and thousands of dollars on these dogs to get these dogs drug trained, and now they're going to have to be retired. Uh, that's a big issue. Uh, mass transit, we had some discussions on mass transit, what it's going to do to mass transit, the ridership, uh, people wanting to go on those uh, light rails with knowing what's going to go on legally now. That's a big issue. Uh, the mental health issue, I mean, I just met with the Rice County uh, Chemical and Mental Health Coalition today on a Zoom, and I asked them what do they think this is going to do. This is only going to make things worse. Uh, it's, it, it's just going to increase more mental health issues. Um, the expungement issue, you're, you're letting people out for who broke a law, but that was in law, and now we're releasing them. Um, I could go on and on. Uh, one of my questions is, why does this affect the, colors of com uh, the communities of color more than it does other communities? Uh, I didn't get that answered today. Um, you know, we had two minutes for our sheriff to testify uh, on, on the ill effects of what this is doing. Uh, that's not ample time to listen to make a major policy change here in Minnesota. Uh, I could go on and on and on about how terrible I think this is going to be for Minnesota. I know we've you know, been open to putting some guide rails on that, and that's, I appreciate the author of doing that. But overall, I can just not sit here quietly and say how this is not going to be so detrimental to our state, to our kids, to our future, to workforce, to driver safety. I, I, it really concerns me from a, a lot of different areas, but I've voiced a lot. I'll let other members talk, but uh, uh, this, again, nothing against Senator Port and your bill, um, but this to me, and this is, and, and I've really tried to weigh in and listen to my people. I've had a lot of people uh, for it. I've had a lot of people against it. Uh, but talking to law enforcement, I have not talked to one law enforcement official in this state that think this is going to help Minnesota. Every single law enforcement officer I've talked to said this will have a negative impact on Minnesota. And I open up for someone to contact me and tell me differently from a law enforcement perspective. Um, so very concerning to me. I'll let it at that. I've probably talked enough. Um, but again, I have some huge concerns um, with this bill. Uh, the, the time it's getting pushed through, I know it's been through several committees, but I, I think of tax relief in Minnesota for families that are struggling with all the costs, and we're pushing through a bill to legalize pot. And so uh, that's my frustrations, and I'll end with that. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for giving me the uh, time to discuss my concerns. Thank you, Senator Jasinski. Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and uh, Senator Port. I see on, on line 65.18, they're not allowed to identify what they're carrying on, their, on, the, on the vehicles when they're transporting it. Is there, is there, and I don't know this, I should know this, but I don't, I've, it's, been, it's 
been a few years since I've, I've been on a hazmat team or on the fire department. So is there any, uh, you know, when they carry fuel or when they have a, a certain oxidizers or whatever over 10 pounds of a certain item, they have to put a placard. Do you know if there's any placard requirements through, through the, uh, through the hazardous materials that they have to placard any of this as they transport it? Is there in a certain amount? Senator Park. Thank you, Chair Dibble and uh, Senator Howe. They are uh, in the environmental parts of the bill uh, that go to those standards. They're still required to, to follow all other safety standards require, uh, regarding hazardous materials that are um, used in the processing or, or anything like that. They're still required to follow all of those. So if they were transporting those, they would be required uh, to, to put that placard on there. Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Senator Port, if I understand you correctly, they still would have to placard that to identify it as whatever they're carrying, and it wouldn't, as long as it's not a telling them that they're carrying them a, a specific item. But it would be on their uh, their their load of their bill of lading. It would still be on there. So, if they end up with an accident, fire department comes, they'd still have to transfer that give that information to the fire department that that's there. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes. Thank you. All right. Anything further on Senate file 73 members? All right. So Senator report, do you have a motion? Uh, yes. I uh, move that Senate file 73 be passed and referred to health and human services. As amended. As amended. As All right. Amended. All right. All in favor of Senator Port's motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed say no. No. Uh, motion carries. All right. Thank you, Senator Port. Thank you, members. Thank you. Great discussion. Went a little long. Not too bad, though. Hour and 10 minutes. Um, or hour and 10 minutes past our adjournment time. Um, before we adjourn, uh, Ms. Ether, do you want to let us know what's happening on Wednesday? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Wednesday, we will be hearing from uh, the agency, uh, the Metropolitan Council. They will be uh, telling us their budget request, and then we'll be hearing agency bills. And we will also hear uh, Senator McEwen's bill uh, pertaining to minimum crew size requirements on trains. All right. With that, members, we are adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>